So, um, seeing the presence of a quorum, we're calling to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee at uh, 6.34 p.m. A few members are down for the count with the flu. Um, so we're going to soldier on in hopes of good health and uh, good committee work, something like that. Um, our first order of business is approval of the minutes of January 23rd, 2018. Now people have had a chance to... to accept the minutes of January 23rd, 2018. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Moved and seconded. Uh, is there any, are there any revisions that people have found? Changes, things like that? Pause for two seconds. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of January 23rd, 2018, please signify by raising your hand. It carries um, with uh, the six folk, the six folks, six folks present. You didn't actually, though. Uh, announcement and public comment. So now it's time for announcements and public comments. If you have, a, a, we're going to do public comments first, which is what we usually do. Um, you can come forward and uh, please state your name to the microphone. I mean, to us actually, but I mean in the microphone. You'll have uh, three minutes to make a, a up to three minutes to make a comment. And we're welcoming them now. Thank you um, for giving us an opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Denise Boyd. I'm a middle school guidance counselor. I'm Tom Sadiq, dean of students at the middle school. Sure. Um, we learned last week that the position of one of our two middle school guidance counselors is being cut. We are here to share some of our deep concerns about this decision. The middle school has two guidance counselors working with our 420 students. We have a multitude of responsibilities, including providing individual counseling, offering groups on organizational skills with students, chairing 504 meetings, and working on sixth grade and seventh grade transition. We hold parent meetings, triage with outpatient providers, and connect with community groups whose work directly impacts students and families. We are active members of the middle school teams, one of us working with seventh grade and one with the eighth. In this capacity, we join teachers to discuss and advocate for students' academic and social needs in the classroom. Guidance counselors support my work as a dean of students um, with students that have um, different behavioral concerns. By holding reflective lunches, um, sharing restorative circles, or participating in attendance meetings, the counselors are important members of the crisis management team, sharing their experience on adolescent development and identifying the social and emotional needs of students in need of interventions or services. In addition, guidance counselors work with the administration on the child study team and student intervention teams, discussing students who are at a behavioral, emotional, medical, or academic risk and struggling and suggesting possible interventions. They are part of the mental health, they are part of the team examining data um, regarding which strategies have been successful. With the loss of one full-time guidance counselor, it's difficult to see how all the responsibilities um, that they have, uh, that have been outlined above, will be handled. Students will experience a disruption in continuity since the guidance counselors move from one grade to another with their students. They also uh, work with teachers on the both the teams. Um, one of the guidance counselors cannot handle the caseload currently handled by two guidance counselors. Some tasks will doubt doubtlessly be reassigned to our already taxed mental health staff. Others will have to be dropped. I mean, which ones these will be? You know, with the reduction in individual counseling, <coughs> excuse me, with, will be a reduction in individual counseling. You know, will counselors who know the students on a personal level, will they have less time to meet with them? Will they be unable to participate in team meetings or attain to the many crises that we deal with on an everyday basis? In addition to our concern about the position being cut, we want to share our dismay that this cutback also means that we will lose Rena Holder as a colleague and guidance professional. Rena is a compassionate, capable, and professional counselor who has served with us for four years. In addition, as a black woman, Rena is the only person of color on our middle school mental health team. As you know, our students in the middle school are composed of black, Latino, Asian, white, and multi-ethnic. Um, research tells us 
the importance of racial mirroring to our young folks. Our human resources team, our human resources department has worked hard to increase the diversity of such models of our staff. It's important that we also work to retain, retain you know, people of color who are vibrant and young and who are currently working in our district. We recognize that in a budget crisis, all cuts are painful. However, we believe that guidance is an essential service tending to the social, emotional, and behavioral needs of our middle schoolers as they negotiate this significant time in their lives. Our school, with, along with others across the country, have been moving forward toward providing more inclusive and supportive environments for all students rather than offering substantially separate programming. We have been taking steps toward becoming a trauma-informed school. Now is not the time to cut counseling staff. We urge the school committee, all of you here, to take steps to preserve funding for middle school guidance, and at that same time, to carefully consider how our district retains staff of color, such as Rena Holder, who contribute so much to our students and community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there are, are there other public comments, if there are, please come forward. Feel free to come forward, I should say. And just again, identify yourself. You'll have three minutes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Katie Lazdowski. Um, I first want to start by just supporting the comments that were just made. That's the first I've heard of that. And um, having taught 7th through 12th grade, I know that's an extremely vulnerable age and would also support those comments made to not cut funding in that area. Um, in regards to funding, I'm also here to speak about a funding issue. I have the privilege as a school equity task force member to meet monthly with um, DW and Mark Jackson and to hear about how the restorative justice program is unfolding. Um, it's really impressive the work that has been done, that DW has been doing this far, really getting a glimpse and an understanding of the culture at the high school and implementing her own style um, and her understanding, building her understanding of um, restorative justice and how it can um, come about or be played out in that setting. Um, I'm here though to advocate for more funding in that area too, because at this point we have a team of one DW, who is spearheading this initiative, and you may or may not know, but this is a, a culture change and a culture shift that needs to happen to allow that restorative justice program to be taken up and implemented the way it is intended. Um, and that entails more funding in regards to training teachers and um, more professional development um, around issues of racism, implicit bias, so that her program, the restorative justice program, is complementing change that's already taking place. Because if we really want this to succeed, and I really bet we do, given the, the values that we hold as this district, um, we need to support that initiative with other ongoing and larger professional development um, efforts. And given the population that we have in our district with increasing numbers of black and brown children, and given the threats we always have of losing, you know, students to other um, choice schools, I really encourage you to stop and think about where you put your spending and what message that sends to our community in regards to how important the brown and black children are in our, in our district. Thank you. Thank you. There. Other public comments? I, I have a, um, <clears throat> a, a public comment on behalf of CPAC. Would this be an appropriate time to bring that? I was going right. to acknowledge school whenever. committee members once okay. the public was done. Yep. I just which they may be. I thought they were <laughs> 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 You're yeah. reading the room. Probably yeah. you're reading the room accurately. But I, I always like, but if they're not, I, I always pause them. for a second in case someone's gathering themselves or grabbing notes or things like that. Which they're not, so. Okay. Is this an appropriate time to Absolutely, do that? yeah. Okay, so this is a, a letter to the school committee on behalf of Nancy Stewart, uh, the president of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, and she was unable to be here tonight, so she asked as the liaison if I could read this on her behalf. January 30th, 2018. Dear school committee members, as the Special Education Parent Advisory Council CPAC president, I want to voice concern over the proposed budget cuts. 
I appreciate what a difficult process this entails and understand a great deal of thought was put into selection of cuts. I am asking for the district to reconsider the cut to the specialized instructional coach position. It concerns me that the district would choose to eliminate a position that has been so positively linked to growth and support to our teachers and students. When I met with you last, I was unaware that this was on the list of possible cuts. It's important for you to hear some more about the role and impact this position affords our district and ask that you reconsider not cutting this position. Co-teaching would not be as successful without support provided from this position. In the recent survey shared with you at a recent school committee meeting, staff provided positive comments about support of coaching and felt significant improvement between special education and general education is being made. In addition to this teacher perception data from the survey, Oh, in addition to this teacher perception data from the survey, the PCG survey results also included a substantial number of positive comments about the district's co-teaching instructional model. The position of the specialized instructional coach is a very important way to both provide training and the ongoing coaching to teachers for this model to be most effective. While we still have work to do in this area, the positive steps are being recognized by local area schools, but also by the state. Now is not the time to cut a position that focuses on providing quality, collaborative, specialized education in the least restrictive environment. The position also enables our district to co-facilitate an in-house district team in addressing the needs of English learners. Specifically, support is provided deciphering the tiers of support and how the eligibility slash evaluation of specialized elementary, sorry, of specialized education may be necessary. Currently, the person in this position attends all CST meetings at ARHS and elementary schools and for students with complex language and learning profiles. Now is not the time to cut a position that directly provides valuable consult into supporting English learners and students with dual needs. By use of this position, our district provides Orton-Gillingham training to staff in-house rather than contracting outside trainers to accomplish this important work. Specifically, over the past two years, about 44 students received OG tutoring of 50 to 100 hours per week with 20 teachers providing the OG instruction. OG is Ord Gillingham. Additionally, an introductory course for staff was provided to further educate staff about reading and dyslexia. Many states have mandated this type of training for educators to enable personnel to provide the specialized instruction to address the needs of students with dyslexia and to work to close, the, work to close achievement gaps. Now is not the time to cut a position that supports teachers' ability to address the needs of students who have dyslexia. I hope by sharing some more of what this position enables the district to provide that you will consider keeping this position. However, if you have more questions, I encourage you to speak with Dr. Brady to better understand the importance of retaining this position. Although this is, this is, a, not, sorry, although this is not a direct teaching position, the loss of this position has direct implications to student achievement. Losing this position puts multiple areas in jeopardy for continued progress that the district has worked so very hard to accomplish. Our staff and students deserve the continued opportunities for progress this position supports. I strongly recommend that the district retain this important position to ensure continued progress. Sincerely, Nancy Stewart, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And I will send that. Debbie, you received a bottle. I have it. Yes, okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks to Nancy Stewart for... Uh in contact with you. Uh, are there other, the public comment section, unless someone else raises their hand, is closed. Um, are there other comments from school committee members, or announcements, I should say, from uh, school committee members, not comments, but announcements from school committee members? Seeing none. Uh, we will proceed to the subcommittee updates. As we can see on our agenda, we already have both Neither of our SCTF members are here, but we have an SCTF discussion later that um, also just that your indulgence, um, the chair of the SCTF asked if we could move that item down until she gets here because um, uh, she, she should get here. Um, so if we can do, we'll, we'll, it'll be a floating item once we get to that item and we'll just keep moving it down and bumping it down. Um, we also obviously have a superintendent evaluation already on the agenda and our two collective bargaining representatives also happen to not be here. So I guess I should say is, is uh, anyone have any other committee action that they want to discuss, committee action they want to discuss? Yeah. No, Emily. just, um, I was gonna mention that we had a but, uh, policy subcommittee meeting last night. We met with Dr., uh, Mr. Mangano and Mr. Harb. Mm -hmm. um, they brought some 
suggestions for us for uh, things to address in the food services collection policy. Huh. Um, and also um, a couple of things brought forward by our new auditor around uh, approving student activities guidelines and uh, a fundraising policy. So those will be coming before you all in the near future. Great. Anything else? <coughs> Seeing, seeing nothing. Uh, do, do we have a handout here? So we've met a lot, so I was just going to. No, that's okay. I was just wondering. It's only of a couple. Quick <laughs> I, I would, I would be digging in my pile <laughs> otherwise. Uh, so, superintendent. Sure. So one thing, since uh, Dr. Bodie's here, I just want to mention that we'll be in Leverett. I think it is the eighth. Yes. Of uh, it was rescheduled for snow. Hopefully, knock on wood, we don't have more snow for a whole host of reasons. Um, but um, that's when we'll go up. You know, we had the lovely event in Shootsbury a couple weeks ago um, to meet with um, interested families in Leverett. And the Leverett Elementary School has been great, as well as Shootsbury, about communicating with their parent network. And so that's just coming up before we meet again. Uh, Saturday, um, or Sunday, excuse me. Well, it's our meeting we'll talk about. We talk about budget. Uh, but Sunday, uh, unfortunately, both Kira and uh, Anastasia aren't here. But the, when Senator Markey came, was very powerful. I know Ms. Wabney Cage you know, wrote about it to both Eric and myself. Uh, just particularly the afternoon session, which was a uh, relatively small group focused with a um, uh, person who's being sheltered, his family, the senator, our senate, our senator, our local, you know, state senator, state representative, and other people involved in immigration activities. Um, and then uh, we got to see middle school uh, choir, as well as the Amherst Gospel Choir, Community Gospel Choir, uh, welcome the event. There was the, they had overflow. It was lots and lots of people. Uh, it was pretty exciting to be able to introduce him. Uh, but I think more than anything, what I walked away with, other than the kind of very personal story we heard uh, from Manny Lucio, was um, just how much of a community effort, you know, and how much people have appreciated the work that the committee's done, the schools have done, and that it's really part of a larger community effort to make sure all of our our community to feel safe to everyone who's in it and, and feel supported. So it was really powerful, and, and thank you. There was a lovely sign that I know Senator Markey was excited to take pictures in front of. And I saw that on Saturday. It was neat. Yeah. A yeah. neat sign. Yeah, so. Yeah, so thank you for that. And I know, uh, you know, I mentioned, I think, the last week about the grant that we received, and Ms. Cunningham's going to do a bit of an update since she's on the steering committee related to that. Okay. So I do want to um, I, um, thank you for mentioning yeah. it. I know that we have spoken previously about this grant, and I'm pleased to announce um, that the five colleges was one of three organizations that received this innovation grant. And so right now, well, we met today because we have to now flesh through what we're going to do with this money. Amherst is looking to have about three to five paras go through the program. And as part of the grant, we have to do things which will help to change the culture in our district. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that many of the comments that were made here tonight talked about a culture change within our district and talked about the importance of having persons of color that reflect our, or mirror our student population. And so this grant will be able to aid in assisting three to five um, paras to move into that role and become teachers and hopefully be licensed by the year of 2020. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Did a lot of, you. We know you did a lot of hard work on that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Are there any questions for the superintendent or otherwise? I am. Sullivan? On the choosing of the paras, you're going to start with paras that are very close to earning their licensure, or are you going to start with paras that are lower and further away from the goal? Okay. So the committee had talked about the paras who are closer as the low-hanging fruit <laughs> so that we can get moving quicker to reach that goal of having them licensed by the year 2020, which is not too far away. So yes, we would be starting with those who are close to it or and, and assisting others through the pipeline along the way. So we're looking at the MTEL because we know that that was one of the biggest obstacles, um, especially you know English language learners or people who don't, English isn't their first language, 
and for them to take the MTEL, which is the communication and literacy one, the biggest one, many times they fail and have to repeat it. So we're looking at offering tutoring and you know any kind of assistance possible to help them to pass that Excellent. and the next MTEL and, and once again do the culture change for the district. Thank you. Okay. Other, other questions? I mean, either for Ms. Cunningham or for the superintendent? Seeing none. Um, I don't think we have a chair's report particularly. I mean, we have a lot of complicated <laughs> things we're dealing with around budget. I think people are aware of that. Um, I don't know if we're we going to talk about this later during FY19 budget feedback, but if um, you've gone, th having gone through the uh, recent four town meeting, um, it's apparent that there's not, there's consensus in one way, which is very positive, which is that the group as a whole wanted to minimize the, the um, potential budgetary impact uh, on the district, which is great. And so there was a, I mean, we'll talk about it later, but this whole method four tier two, um, which is a convoluted language that we can probably simplify later, um, at least minimizes the cuts, but, um, one of the challenges with it, um, and I think this came out in the discussion that day, but also some of the subsequent discussion, is that there, there's also not generalized agreement around how we're going to work together as towns to apportion our responsibility for the budget. And there continues to be sort of a lingering challenge about whether or not the towns all collectively have the same understanding and vision for what our schools are funding and what they're trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, it's, it's very challenging. And so I think one of the things that was talked about that day that I think the school committee should take up, and I recognize this echoes number five on here, but I think it's going to take a, some collective work and discussion on our parts to think about how, how we take a more active role in organizing a conversation with our respective towns and other parties outside of our towns around stool district funding and financing and support. And I think one of the things, I'm saying this because this does go to sort of agenda uh, and uh, other duties that the chair typically has, is I think one of the things we also have to do is we've started to do, I think, a really nice job over the last um, year, a little more than a year, um, uh, at the elementary district as well, um, to have conversations and presentations that deepen and extend our understanding of what our programming is setting out to accomplish, what do our teachers do, in light of the conversation, we've the multiple comments that were made today without discussing those comments, we've heard discussion of the valuable value of the different set of professionals who are parts of the team that work to engage um, both our teaching staff, our full staff, and parents and, and families, guardians, and students. And um, I think to the extent that our understanding of the complexity of that environment and the complexity of stability in terms of building over time, the capacity that allows us to succeed in these school settings, um, if, if certainly my knowledge of this is deepened, and I think other members of the committee have expressed that theirs have too, then it's even more so, frankly, for people who are only have a, a secondary or tertiary connection to the schools um, throughout our district. And so one of the points I'd make on this is I think as we're looking out over the next year and we're thinking about what we're doing, we have to build in more opportunities for public conversation around what our schools are accomplishing, how they're adjusting to certain pressures we have, and the good work that we're doing. That, that encompasses a lot, I recognize. We don't actually have a communications item on our agenda right now. And some of that's also thinking about different ways of exposing um, the public and different leaders to it. But uh, I'm, just, I'm saying this out loud simply because it's something that's going to require a lot of work, and I want to think about a lot of that work as well. Yes. Hey, yeah, I just want to just as you were talking about the five, the, how many towns? Four, sorry, four, four towns yeah. meeting. Um, j just for the public, I think you know you said that the 
what was sort of generally, there was some amount of consensus around a method that you said minimize the cuts, and I think I just want to say, and I, this is not yeah. to correct, but just I, to be real clear, really clear for the public sure. that I think um, it was cuts that could potentially be, there were more cuts that we were concerned that uh, there was a level worse than where it sort of, we landed possibly, yeah. but the cuts are not minimal. And I would, oh, no, I, no, and no. I'm not saying that you're saying that, it just, yeah. I want to make sure that that's really clear and that I feel like in that room there was, there, I'm not sure there was a person who didn't really have a sense of sort of the pain that we're, we're looking at here as we make these cuts. So I just, I just wanted to, that was, does that? I'm going to correct you. I could, that's fine. There were definitely a couple of people there who did not okay. get I was the, to be the gentle, message of the pain. No, no, I understand that, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying if you, no, but I'm not, the super majority, the super majority, <laughs> the super majority of people were trying to minimize the level of the cuts. Yeah. Interestingly, it was not in fact unanimous. Right. I think uh, in fact, there were a couple of yeah. people who expressed the notion that, uh, they, they were skeptical that, that the district couldn't absorb all the cuts yeah. it could take, essentially. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I apologize. I don't. Maybe, that wasn't meant to be a question. You know what's funny? I just wanted it's, to. I'm, it's, I mean, uh, we have a, apparently we have a chief executive officer in our nation who treats everything like a TV show. And <laughs> and, 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 and this episode, we it's now sequentially, we spent last, last week, we spent um, like two and a half hours on the budget. And so in my mind, I'm sort of building cumulatively off of our last, not, a la not last week's episode, but our last meeting. And, um, and we spent a lot, of, as you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the level of, le the minimal level of cuts that we need to have just to even get our necks above water under the best of circumstances. They are significant. It is, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm only backing up what you're saying. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to imply that at all. It, it's just sort of the, and in fact, actually, I was going to a darker place initially, because to me, it's like, <laughs> no, because to me, it's like the, the, the consensus that we wanted to try to pick the method that was sort of at the, the middle point of the cuts, not the worst, was, was good news. But in fact, for all of us who were there, the underlying tenor of the conversation was actually far more troubling, that there's, there just isn't consensus around how we're going to move forward as a district. And funding um, our bu the budget we need. I don't think there's uniform understanding about what we're accomplishing with the staffing we have. And unfortunately, uh, this parallels even national and state uh, discussions that, you know, everything one looks like what they used to call a walrus, meaning just like a, a worthless hack that could just be cut. No one said that about any of our staff, so I don't want to go there. But my point is, if you're not careful and you don't actually understand what we're doing with our, what our staff is doing, it's easy to look into a room and see five people and say, well, why can't you have three, right? And, 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 w and with all respect and love to our neighbors um, the other side of the Connecticut River, one of the things they're having currently a debate at, at one of the schools in Northampton is the question of what is an appropriate staffing pattern to try to maximize the ability to do an inclusion model at an elementary level, right? And not only what's the staffing pattern, but what's the optimal staffing in the sense of you know, if you're doing some folks who do a really wonderful job of uh, instructional and learning methods versus people who may have behavioral or social and emotional issues, what's the balance in staffing there, right? And, and my point is, there's a complexity to this stuff that's really challenging. Now, that's a situation which has become a, a troubling debate in that town, and I wish them all the best of luck because I know their intentions are good. Here, we've come from a different place where we actually have really good schools that are in many ways performing in an outstanding way. And that's actually more troubling because when things are going largely well, and you largely are doing a good job, and you have things like the CPAC survey that showed a tremendous improvement in people's views, it's far easier to get complacent and say, well, then you must be able to absorb a 5 or 10% cut without it being a big deal, right? Because you're doing a good job. So it poses a challenge to grip to political agreement, but also, frankly, to do it in the context of a learning environment in which people simply, let me put it this way, I'll put it more, even more plainly. If there's going to end up being a disagreement about the future direction of our schools and how we support and fund it, then let, it, let's, let it be a highly transparent and clear one where everyone understand what the alternatives and choices are, and we're not running with sort of myths around um, whether we have uh, extra to cut or not. And there's a clear understanding. And I realize I'm, I'm perilously treading on debating and debating myself and debating with the microphone. And so I'm really gonna stop this because
I wouldn't want any of you to do this, so I shouldn't do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I need to move us along. <laughs> uh, new and continuing business. Well, this is this is a good item. Closing of inactive revolving funds. Sure. So, one. So, uh, in front of you, you have a list of a number of inactive revolving funds, and they haven't been used in over three years. And so our auditors recommended that we vote to close these, close the balances in these funds to our E&D account. So this will have a positive effect on our E&D and potentially next year's budget um, by closing the total of $27,249 into our, it'll close into our miscellaneous revenue, which will then go into our E&D account at the end of the year. Um, most of these, as you can see, are text revolving. So some of these don't exist anymore. We used to have text for like um, athletics. There used to be a text. Um, business program, we used to have a tax, we don't have that course anymore. Um, so a lot of these, th the courses don't exist or the courses no longer use a textbook. Um, some of them I honestly don't know what they are. They've been here since I first started and <laughs> so there's not, not really a, a trail of um, why they came into existence in the first place. Um, but we do know that they haven't been used in a number of years. Um, can you just share with the committee and the, the public what a revolving fund is? Because I think that'll yep. contextualize when sure. people see the cut. So the, the school district the uh, operates a number of revolving funds, and revolving funds are set up to manage um, separate revenue sources and expenditure activities. So an example would be athletics. Athletics has a revolving fund, which collects participation fees and then gets used on athletic um, mm -hmm. activities. Um, we also have, as you can see here, we have a number of textbook revolving uh, accounts for different subjects. So when a student loses a textbook and they pay that fee to get a new textbook, that fee goes into this revolving fund and ultimately someday gets used to buy replacement textbooks um, for that program. So that's what most of these are, our textbook revol uh, revolving funds. Okay. Yep. I'll either take a motion or a question from the committee. There's a motion at the bottom of the sheet. I'll move to transfer residual funds from the listing above of revolving funds to the general funds miscellaneous revenue account. Is, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there further questions or debate over this? That's Can you yeah. just tell us what the eco bus revolving fund is, if you know? That? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time, we had a eco bus up at the high school. It was. Um, like a very old school version of an electric school bus and it was used by a class up there. Um, this one I do remember because when I first started we actually sold it to somebody. Um, in fact we didn't really sell it, they were the only people that would come and take it. Uh, <laughs> um, so they saved us money, uh, cost avoidance. Um, but So there used to be a bus up there that used to be worked on. I don't know how it generated revenue, I'll be honest, because it wasn't operational when I first started. Um, but the eco bus, it used to be a bus up at the high school. Okay, that that, that was used for the schooling. School yeah. yeah. Or further, what do you know? Where does this money go? So this money will go into our miscellaneous revenue account, which is a, a general fund revenue source. Um, it wasn't budgeted for, so that's good. That means it'll be surplus, and it'll go into the E and D account at the end of the year, which we can then appropriate for future year budgets. Okay. Anything? So the eco bus was like the magic school bus. <laughs> that's what I like to think. Yeah. It was. I mean. It went around, and students were able to do science projects and experiments on the bus. Mm -hmm. We even had our own Miss Frizzle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all those in favor of the motion as presented, please signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously. All items can go this easily, huh? Uh, authorization of stabilization expenditures. Sure. So uh, we started this practice last year, which is having the school committee approve all expenditures out of the district stabilization fund. The district has a stabilization fund specifically for capital, um, and it's used for very limited things. So I gave you sort of a snapshot of the entire year, both revenues and expenditures, but really I'm just asking you to approve the expenditures. So on the revenue side, uh, or you can see the beginning balance this year of 434000 in the stabilization fund. Uh, we had earnings on that balance of 1700 approximately. This year in the FY18 budget, you approved a contribution into the stabilization fund, specifically for the track, you may recall. Uh, it was added to last year's budget, so that's a revenue into the stabilization fund. 
And then we have two expenses. The first one is interest on our bond anticipation note, which is what, how we fund our FY 16, 17, and 18 capital projects. One of the notes came due and we have to roll it over another year. And when that happens, we have to pay the interest on that note. And then the other one is we have a debt schedule for reimbursing the town of Amherst for uh, a renovation job they did at Summit Academy about six or seven years ago at this point. And so this is the regular payment um, in, our, in our schedule. And there's probably two or three more years of that schedule left. Um, so the total outflow of the stabilization fund is 13617 And at the end of the year, we expect the stabilization fund to have a balance of about $491,000. Okay. I would entertain a motion. One were forthcoming. I move to approve the FY18 disbursements from the capital stabilization fund as shown above. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there questions? Comments? Debate? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion as presented, please signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, where are we on our schedule, anyways? I think we're actually about to start running ahead. Don't say it. Look at that. We're running ahead. Uh, I, now we're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently there are cookies over there. <laughs> we need something to distract ourselves. Um, uh, FY19 budget feedback. Want to introduce this? Yeah, if I could. So. Um, I thought this would be an opportunity to share both, uh, and the chair already did, um, but a little bit of my perspective of um, the results of the four town meeting, perhaps less, more on the immediate for the FY19 and less on the very accurate state. And less cosmic, state. that's okay. <laughs> I, I wasn't framing it that way, but um, I, think, I think you raised very serious and important points about the health of the region's finances into the future. Um, I thought I was going to, since this one said FY19, just update, you know, both the committee who wasn't there, but also the community uh, about how um, the result of that and then sort of what's coming in terms of the budget process. And then I could take any comments or feedback from the committee if that's okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. So um, I think as, as was spoken about before, the um, outcome of the meeting was that um, there was consensus for next year on a five-year phase-in of the current statutory method, which in nomenclature that only would understand if you sat through the meeting, means a tier two level of cuts. Uh, the number, which I think is important, is $1.376 million of reductions that are being, uh, that was the agreement. Um, I think as we've said all along, we did the early budget reductions uh, and presented them publicly to you all last Tuesday as well as on Saturday with a bit of um, apprehension because we knew it was before certain variables would be known. So even between last Tuesday, for those people who are watching, and Saturday, things change. And the big thing that changed is that the state came out with the, their budget and because of the mm -hmm. ratio of um, what each town would pay in minimum contributions, there were some shifts to the overall numbers and then therefore shifts to what cuts would be made or not made. And, and I think as we were clear on even on Saturday, there's more of that to come. So the state aid piece is more clear, although it's still the governor's budget and when we get to region, uh, regional district advocacy, I think there'll be some commentary I'd like to share and, and the committee may be interested in talking about with that. Um, things that are happening even since Saturday, we now have more clarity on our vocational roster for this year. We get updates from directly from the vocational schools um, in the region as compared to just for those Amherst members, the Amherst public schools. The charter costs aren't just, and I'm only doing this as a point of comparison, not because I'm trying to talk about the Amherst public schools. Um, the charter costs are paid directly in the year at the region, so the fact that we have fewer charter students, it sort of matters who they are because you have to figure out who's going to get, how much reimbursement we're going to get. So it's great that there's less charter students than we're anticipating, but depending who they are really flips the numbers. So now we have more clarity, we're gathering more clarity on the VOC and the charter piece. Um, one of the things that happens is we, we typically contractually, we ask staff to who are going to retire to let us know 18 months in advance, and there's some incentive to do that financially. And yet life happens. And sometimes people a couple months before the end of the year say, you know what, you know, this is happening in my life. I'm going to choose to retire in June, even though, the, you know, it's unanticipated. We, we would call it unanticipated retirements because we, we, we do budget planning for those who tell us 18 months in advance. So we've, we've had some of that in the last couple of weeks, including like this morning. So um, we're, we're now factoring that into things. 
uh, utilities, I think, got locked in today. So Sean pressed the button or whatever that myth. I always think he has like a big red button that he presses and utility yep. rates get locked yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like my imagery better. Um, but um, so utility rates, which as we shared last time, were not locked in, are now locked in. Um, probably the biggest thing on here, the two last ones I'll mention are the second quarter budget update is just about ready. That'll be shared on the 13th at the next meeting. And to the point that that was the dialogue just about um, even the funds going back into E&D, one of the challenges we faced last year, this year, looking to next year is because of the health insurance surcharge increases, we, we did not anticipate being able to put as much in E&D back into the budget because we, we generally we put it back in the budget and then we use it in next year's operating budget. So we've frozen the budget, as you know, the last month and a half. Um, so we have to see how successful that's been and, and the implications there. Um, and the last one is health insurance. I know that there's the health insurance advisory trust that is actively working on things. We won't have clarity on that but uh, for a while, but we have to account for some of those things. So those are, I'm just mentioning those as variables. And so what will happen, what I would anticipate happening is before we get to the 13th, certainly at least the Friday before, if not sooner, uh, we'll show your, share with you an updated um, budget that accounts for all of these things and try to clarify why there's a change from last Tuesday to Saturday till two, two weeks from today, uh, two nights from today, as well as updated uh, additions and, and cut lists, because that is the public hearing. So we'll put that on the website and be very, you know, people want to see that uh, ahead of time they certainly can because that that's that evening's the budget hearing so um, I think there's likely to be some changes um, I would not anticipate we're still talking about one point something million dollars of cuts we're not talking about ooh magically we're, we're cutting you know twenty five thousand dollars like that's not in the realm of variation uh, but every every small bit matters and a lot of these factors are you know challenging to predict and that's one of our I say my but <coughs> excuse me I think I can say our apprehensions about sharing it earlier is once you put a number out there with cuts, then that's the number and those are the cuts that, that people perceive. Um, so that's our challenge, but we, I think it was successful. I don't regret doing that because I think the four towns really did need to see the reductions to understand and come to some consensus for, for this year on the budget. Um, but that's sort of where we are in process. I don't know, Mr. McGonagall, if there's anything you'd like to add. I think I mentioned this um, the last time. Also, the only other variable that you didn't mention explicitly is food services. Oh, yeah, Again, sorry. we have a new food service in-district program, which we're every month looking at the results, and so far it's been good. Um, but that's just another variable that we're trying to factor in and how to project for next year since this is our you know, first three months of an in-district program or first four months of an in-district program. So, Thank you. Should we do that? You mentioned there was some disagreement over the budget at the four town meeting. When and how do we reconcile these differences? I think I th uh, I think that um, in terms of this year's budget, uh, and others can tell me if they heard something different because a number of you were here were there rather. Um, I think there was was general agreement to pick, you know, the tier two cuts method for tier two is a which is a ridiculous way of talking, but it's a line on a table basically um, that was shared that day. And there was, and I should say, because I don't, I don't want to. It's kind of a funny thing. I'm toggling between where Ms. Hazard was and where I was on this. Is that it, well, we have to give credit and recognition to the towns that once we walk through the potential cuts, I think people were very sobered by that, and immediately the thinking crystallized around, you know, the le the least impactful method that we could we could agree upon at that table, and so. Um, what we're going to find out over the next few weeks is whether that basic agreement holds on that particular method. If it holds, then then we're good. Essentially, we're not good for this year, but it's procedurally, we can move forward with that budget. The the school, the regional committee could then recommend, vote, and send to the towns that budget at our early March meeting, which is what I foresee that we would be doing. Um, the challenge, and this is why these are related topics, the challenge is what level of communication or dialogue we have um, amongst the towns about what implication there is on, this, on the budget for this year for what we're doing next year. And just because, again, we did, it wasn't televised, so people watching now don't know what we talked about on Saturday. Essentially, 
the the point of disagreement came down to whether or not the towns were agreeing to move to the current statutory method in full um, phased in over a period of three years or five years um, or, or not agreeing to do that at all basically and so the challenge is we could agree on a budget figure and an allocation for the towns this year we in fact could even just agree to do that and we could agree next year to do another allocation at, an, at another level um, but the, the, the question is whether there's a political agreement between the towns. Some towns felt strongly that if we were committing to a five-year phase in, so for example, of the statutory method, then that's what we're agreeing to do, and that's what we're all agreeing to do. I know, speak, you know, if I'm not going to name which towns, I'll say there's another town um, that was very vocal that they were precisely not agreeing to do that. Um, and I'll leave it at that. They weren't. They were. They were agnostic as to what would happen next year. And so the question is: Does that second question of what the broader long-term agreement does that end up disrupting the agreement about what our budget is this year or not? Yes, Mr. Nino. To clarify, sorry. the assessment methods that for this year is agreed upon. It it can be, and it was. It was not. No, no, no. I'm not trying to be funny about this. Okay. The everyone at the meeting the other day. Um, left agreeing to, again, it's, it's a completely ridiculous way of talking, method four, tier two. They, they, everyone agreed to that. Mm -hmm. But the problem, the reason I'm saying it this way is the problem is some towns said they were agreeing to that method, but they were agreeing to it only for one year, and then they were going to reopen the question of what we do next year. And other towns were saying, oh, dear goodness, I am definitely not going to reopen this conversation next year. Um, and for whatever reason, it could be out of exhaustion or just philosophical disagreements. I think it was one of them. I think both were expressed. And the question ends up being if the towns aren't in fact committing to the long run question, do then they backtrack on the agreement on the, on the budgetary method just for this year? And I don't, I don't think we really know that yet, but my hope is because of the discussion of the level of the cuts and everything, my hope is that people can commit to do this this year. Um, can I do, it's, it's a little bit of a tangent. I mean, it's on budget, but it's not Fog Fort Town meeting. Is that a? Yeah, sure. Okay. So just the two follow-up items I wanted to talk about, because I know there was questions uh, last week about it. One is on a vocational school. So we have talked to the middle school who would be the, where students would be applying and so so far we have uh, had multiple students apply to Vogue school but all of them chose only to apply to Smith mm -hmm. uh, for students who are who come in who share an interest in applying to a different school um, that hasn't happened yet but the messaging will be we we're not saying not to do that but we would encourage you to apply to Smith as well so that you know and explain sort of the situation but to date no student has come in expressing an interest to apply to any Vogue school other than Smith the second thing on that topic is uh, the night after, so last Wednesday, uh, the Smith, Voke, uh, and Ag Board of Trustees met. Um, they had a positive, I mean, we shared similar documents back and forth, and they had a very positive read. I think their only concern expressed was, will everyone want to do this? Affair? Right, you know, so, um, but that's on their end, but I think there was genuine consensus and interest in both committees voting in the month of February um, to solidify an agreement. Um, the uh, last update I want to have, because I know people were asking about it as well, is so I did uh, last Thursday with Principal Sloven, uh, spent about 45 minutes with students talking at Summit Academy about the potential shift. Um, I think he was uh, very accurate in his assessment. There were some students who were really excited. Um, one student said it would be dope. I felt really cool because I knew what he meant. Um, <laughs> is that good or bad? Good, good. Um, that's how I read it. Um, and, um, and other students expressed more concerns. I think the, the three salient themes, one was that, uh, and I just took my notes from when I was there, that separation is important, that they wanted to be assured that there wouldn't be high school students walking through their hallway, that their classes would still be small. I mean, one student, I think, said it best, and I didn't have it quite quoted, but he said, I'd be so excited to be in the high school, but to learn I need to be in this space, can I do both, right? So he was asking the question of like, I'd like from a social perspective, there's a lot of questions, the second theme is about lunch, lots of discussions about lunch and how that works and whether that's a 
sort of uh, flexible time or not flexible time, and really strong differing opinions among the students. Sure. But, but it's related to the first point um, because he was able to articulate incredibly clearly his interest in if I'm not in a small setting with small classes with teachers who know me, I'm not going to do the learning I need to do. So um, that was really clear, and that was whatever students' reaction was, that was shared universally. Uh, there was a lot of questions about lunch. Some students saw that as an opportunity where they could be connecting with peers outside the academic setting. Some students really like the not being in a large cafeteria. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Principal Slovin did an excellent job of saying, these are problems that we'll work out together, right? It doesn't have to be the same for everybody. We'll have that flexibility. And, and so that, I think, was reassuring. There was a student I knew since she was in first grade from Crocker Farm, so she made sure I would say that they want a vending machine. That is the make or break. Um, say, And I'd say that somewhat in jest, but somewhat because for her, um, it was important that they felt like they were getting the same access to the same, like, you know, they were expressing Summit Academy, the food, you know, while we're doing better with it doesn't, the cafeteria is not there. But they don't have some of the various kind of rights and privileges, so to speak, of vending machines and all that. It's not the same they setup. vending machine there? Not in the same way the high school does. I can't say if they do, but they don't have, I mean, the high school has like multiple vending, if you oh, walk okay. down the hallway, there's a lot of choices, I'll put it that way. Okay. Um, so, um, but I think, so while that was, she was very serious about it, what I took about it is, how do they get treated more, like feel equally, yeah. you know, in the setting. And I think the third thing was a huge interest in what space it would, you know, some students had experienced the high school, either through athletics or just for other, you had been there. And so they were very invested uh, at the end. We offered for them uh, if people would like to walk it and offer feedback. So we shared the designs that Mr. McPherson had drawn. And a number of students right away said, you know, can we walk it? Can we go? Can we see the space? Can we inform that practice? So Principal Slovin's setting that up. He's also setting up uh, information sessions for parents. Okay. Sometime before the break, we're still working on scheduling, which is a little, uh, a little quirky uh, given other events the district's having. Um, but I thought it was really good, and, and speaking to him, it conti that conversation has continued every day, right? So it's when they have their community meeting, lots of dialogue, and uh, I was just incredibly impressed by the students to um, understand, you know, some of the issues at physical infrastructure issues at Summit, understand the opportunities and understand the challenges, and wanting to be part of the problem solving of the challenges that they identified. Um, so. Um, I thought it was a really useful um, session, and the, uh, sorry, I'm going a little bit long on this, but I think it's worth saying. The staff was uh, also incredible, um, the teaching staff. They were in counseling staff. They were able to um, provide their own feelings about it very candidly. Um, also talk about prior changes. The program it used to be in two sites, for those of you who remember, it used to be at East Street and then Southeast Campus, and some of the fears that were going on there and what they did to, to alleviate those. and. Um, I was just so impressed the way they were connecting with the, the students um, throughout. I mean, certainly Principal Slovin and myself were facilitating, but they were jumping in in ways and making sure that students who were more reticent to speak could speak in private and then have those thoughts be voiced by them sometimes, sometimes by the students, sometimes by the staff. Um, just such a supportive environment. And um, so I think um, lots of good work happening and trying to set up a tour as well as family event for uh, those students, but it was really powerful to hear from the students themselves. Mr. Dalton? I just want to say that I've heard from a number of students that are in this school right. and their con their concern was about the students from Southeast or Summit right. that they really do want to come here and be comfortable. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and our principal Jasker has expressed that as so, well. So what's the next um, step? Uh, so we have a hearing obviously on the 13th. But I think, apart from, obviously, we welcome anyone who wants to to come in and give their opinions that day. Um, but on these sort of bigger ticket issues um, that we know we're looking at, when do we, when do we get follow-up or some further opportunity, for example, to, to listen to Principal Slovin and hear before the decision is made? I mean. Yeah. I guess what, I, what I'm also trying to say is, I guess, assuming since the committee hasn't voted the budget, I'm assuming we haven't had a hearing yet, right. I'm assuming that the decision hasn't effectively been made already. That's correct, yeah. And so if that's true, 
then the question would be what's the next natural time point for the community to be able to learn and get a refreshed view mm -hmm. of how this is going. So principal on, on any of these issues, but in Summit Academy in particular. Right, so he's planning to attend on the 13th and share an update um, as the ongoing dialogue has, occurs at Summit. Um, mm -hmm. On the VOC one, I mean, I do believe both for our students' best interests as well as for, uh, I think, the Board of Trustees at Smith, I think they are hoping to have a vote next month. I think otherwise it puts students in a little bit of limbo and, and I think the board, uh, their, their Board of Trustees is feels like it's a reasonable timeline for them to make that commitment as well. I'm curious about something. Is, um, is Franklin Tech aware of this discussion going on? That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Um, I, I was talking to that. I will confirm that with um, Superintendent Smith. So I'm not 100% sure they, um, I'm not, I, I don't want to expand on it because I don't want to expand I'm on just, it. But, the reason I'm yeah. just curious is I'm just thinking about this like thing. If everything is naturally running toward a decision where we say yes, right. um, how does the committee satisfy itself right. that mm -hmm. if there was a contrary voice to come forward, right. they knew enough about it to be able to come forward? I mean, I'm not trying to stir up trouble right. for the sake of trouble. Yeah. It's really a matter of, of like, you, don't, you don't want to wake up in March or April after the decision has been made and the contract's done, and all of a sudden people are coming out of the woodwork saying, oh my gosh, I realize it's my fault, I, you right. know, three people in my family had the flu, now all of a sudden, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, and that's why we continue to check in with the middle school guidance <coughs> staff around, because that's generally how it works, is students and families contact their eighth grade guidance counselor, say I'm interested in Vogue School, set up a meeting, um, and to date there hasn't been anyone um, and by February, just the, yeah. the timelines apply to Vogue. If, if there were students interested, they would be. Right. I mean, it, obviously, logically, the Summit Academy circumstance is different simply because since there's already an active conversation right. within Summit Academy, I'm assuming that if for any reason uh, the principal and others come to the conclusion that right. it's not advisable, that that dialogue will be well surfaced. Exactly. I'm sure it will be. Sullivan. So that means, so... Usually there's a field trip to both Franklin Tech and to Smith from the middle school every year. And does that, so this time it would just be to Smith. Is that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, I'm sorry, Dr. Bodie's not here right now. I'm trying to think of the timing of when that typically occurs. Like it's at, uh, was after the sixth graders came to the middle school. Right, so I will confirm when that, those trips happen. Yeah. So I just wanted to, we, you sent us an update that a letter had gone out to all the Muslim parents. Uh, this, is that correct? No. No? What does that mean? Wait, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Preschools. The preschool families. Preschool definitely were all contacted. Oh, it was about Summit, Summit Academy. Academy. A letter about Summit. Summit Academy, every okay. family got a letter and a okay. phone call. Yeah, and preschool the same. Okay, so, the, so there's not sort of a public um, announcement going on about other than through guidance. Is that correct? I just want to say that the only bummer to this whole thing of going transitioning to just Smith is that for Leverett and Shutesbury, who are in Franklin County, that's like our last little. Um, I don't. I don't know what the what the right word is, but you know that's. There are some families from Leverett and Shutesbury who choose, whose families have always gone to Franklin Tech. And you know we're just going to lose that. Yeah. That's sort of why I keep bringing. This. I brought it up last week, and I'm bringing it up now. <laughs> yeah. Is it may be the logical thing to do, and maybe we should do it. But I'm kind of trying to continue to give an opportunity that if there are ten families up in Shutesbury that want to create a hullabaloo, that at least they're aware this is happening, so that they can, if they want it, they can. They can come next week or two weeks mm -hmm. from now and. Right. Tell us what they think. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if they don't, then it's, you know, there's a 5% logic that we're probably going to head down this road unless, you know, people are given a compelling reason not to. Anything else? I mean, this is, so this is a wide stuff on budget. I've asked, obviously, a few questions. I think Dr. Morris has laid out quite a bit. What are the things people want to either say or ask now before we move on? I just want to... Um Say that um, after the at the end of the the four town meeting on Saturday, the 
Shootsbury Finance Committee and the Shootsbury School Committee got together and um, we decided that regardless of what method is used, we would, Shootsbury wants to um, put in the um, highest amount it's been tagged for in this, in the summary. We, th we felt that since Amherst was going with the, adding that to 3.5, yeah. that we would uh, put in the 2.16 or whatever that amount is, regardless of which method is chosen. Okay. Do you know this? I am unaware and appreciate incredibly. Yeah, yeah no, no, I do too. I just was like, this is. This yeah, no, this is new news to me. This is good news. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh. Sure. Sorry. I was going to go around the table, oh, actually. Okay, I just, um, Serena, do you have anything else? Mrs. Kinsky? I mean, I think I want to just thank uh, the whole team that put together the budget. I know it's um, very difficult, um, and I think it was a very informative discussion. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of details to still be worked out as all the numbers um, come in, and I'm hopeful that we get some public comment about, um, you know, if things move in a positive direction, um, some things that are very important to our community to try to save. Um, I appreciate that feedback um, from community members that are, that are closer to the school than I am. Thank you, Shootsbury. Sincerely, I mean, you guys really, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, just sort of thinking about the process um, as, as we go to this next stage in the vote, uh, or the hearing, the hearing is next, and then the vote is in March. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, you know, as the numbers come in, as so we get a, a, a sort of a more settled number, and, uh, you know, let's say it's, there's another $40,000 that we're able to allocate somewhere. I mean, I, you know, at this point that then opens, we have, at this point it's, out there, what is being considered? Yes. So, and and you know, we're starting to get advocacy about one position or another, which is, you know, always challenging because, of course, it's every person who stands up and speaks it, it speaks with such, um, you know, heartfelt sincerity about what the importance, and you know, and we all hear that and we all respect that so deeply, and you know, at the same time, it's it's such a complex web that it's it's hard to necessarily. No, for those who are not here speaking, you know, it's not to say that there's not equal pain in different areas. I mean, I, I just think it's, I, I want to recognize the, the sort of the, the complexity of that and the, the challenge there. So just, so as y you go forward and, you know, see where there's might be some shifts, sort of what the process is there. I mean, I assume then you'll get, you'll revise it and give us another sort of look at where we are. But I guess I'm not quite exactly sure what I'm asking, but. I'll try to yeah. answer it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That'd be helpful. Um, so, uh, so given that 410 meeting happened, we got a bunch of financial stuff since, I know it's Tuesday and that was Saturday, but lots have happened since then and there's a couple more things that we have to tie up. So tomorrow morning, for instance, I'm meeting with principals all morning, um, going over the feedback we received, not just tonight, but there's been lots of feedback that happens just more directly that doesn't go to the school committee, but just goes to either principal, assistant principals, myself, Doreen, you know, Sean, things like that, and seeing with, you know, what we think our number, where we think our budget number will land, what we're able to do, I think, um, and I don't want to push the point, and I don't know how to say this better than I'm going to say it, but I think it, it, it I think it's good to be transparent about it. I think this Smith, I'm glad you keep on bringing it up um, because I think it's very real. And when we think about the priorities, some of which we heard earlier tonight about retaining staff, particularly staff of color, that's, you know, when we're talking about 1.3 million or 1. Point anything million, we're doing either ors, right? We're, we're not able to do the and kind of conversations that we'd like to. And so we try to take in all that feedback about um, impact on students, as well as thinking about what our district priorities are. We're aware that, you know, all of our shared, and I speak collectively, shared district priority around um, particularly retaining high quality staff of color is, is, you know, we've talked about a lot and we'll continue to talk about a lot. We'll talk about it in a couple minutes um, in terms of SCTF goals. Um, and so I think we try to take all those things and what we'll do is we'll share a revised number, a revised number and budget list with you for the hearing, and, but it's an iterative process. So we'll go through that, we'll share it with you. I'm sure people will come to the hearing, they'll be advocating for things either that they advocated for tonight or informally or formally. 
um, and we'll take that feedback. And that's just the nature of the budget process, particularly in a year where we're talking about uh, making significant shifts and structural changes. And you know, two of the ones we highlighted tonight um, in our year. And, and I think you know, the hard thing is it's sort of a zero sum game. Like we have to get to that number. Um, Shootsbury's willingness to support us to have a different number um, greatly appreciated, but I think you know that's going to be our challenge. But you know our process is you know really just starts. I mean Sean's been doing a lot of work in the last 72 hours, but kind of on the ads cuts list, really begins tomorrow morning to say okay what are we hearing given the feedback given kind of some revised numbers because we haven't been with principals since we got to I think a landing place in terms of the assessment method uh, and directors and not just principal principal directors where are we going to land. What are some things that we feel like we can live with? What are the things we can live without? Um, and bring that back to the next step in that iterative process. Thank you, Is that's that, helpful. That's okay. exactly sort of like, how does that feedback get? Yep. What's the cycle? Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I guess just kind of building on that, um, so you're saying that the revised budget estimates and cut lists will be available to the public before the hearing, so that people, when they're planning, if they're coming to make comments, they're the latest information that That's been our practice that we'd like to continue, yes. I think that's Anything else? Yeah. Just to be clear, by the way, I wasn't, um, I'm not bringing up the change in, potential change in access to vocational schools because I'm looking to cause trouble <laughs> in terms of the budget right. and create a cut somewhere else. Yeah. It's it's just that when I, when I look at the lists of ads and cuts, there are some decisions that um, everything has a cost to it, and I know that's true. I mean, figuratively and literally, right? <laughs> um, and so if you cut the equipment line, um, that has a real impact to it. It's also one where you can probably increase the equipment line next year if the budget gets better. The challenge is if you never can, right? Um, when you start making changes, though, that are long-term and programmatic, and so I'm picking on this just because it's because yeah. it's so it's it's it can be emotional for people, you know. If they were in fact legacy families and they knew that their older older brother or sister or whatever had gone to uh, Franklin Tech and they wake up one morning and they realize that option is no longer available to them, that's that's more akin of saying, should Summit Academy be in the high school or in, in, at the southeast campus because. Like, you're not just, I mean, the next year, if the budget's a little better, you're not just going to move some academy back, right? right? Like, that's a really big decision. Yes. And and I, and I would argue the same thing, as crazy as this may sound, that, that there's a risk when you start cut. I mean, this is also true, I think, probably for the, the instructional coaching around right. co-teaching um, that we were hearing discussion about earlier. But, um, but it's also true even at some point, if you're cutting back athletic games and you're going from 12 games to eight games or whatever it is, that that there's an experience that you're starting to not get. Yeah. And the more you do that, the more yeah. it's hard to build back. Certainly if you cut sports, which are, is not on the table if we don't have to do the right. deeper tier cuts, you, you can't just build a sport back up. And so it's part of my lens on this is when I'm looking at the, those budget items, if something is changing us into a, a vector or direction that is essentially irreversible or very hard to reverse, then I'm just asking more questions. It's not because I don't think we should Absolutely. do it. Yeah. And if I think it's more likely to be a, a terrible one-year fix or even a terrible two-year fix, then, I'm, then I'm, my, my mode is to be more deferential and say, there are no really good options here. So I want I personally want to try to support the work of you and your team as much as I can in an environment in which, you know, these aren't these aren't decisions you want to make anyway. That's right. So I, I'm sorry to explain that, but I just wanted to oh, absolutely. Be, be clear on it, because I, I, I'm not being uh, capricious or something in absolutely. the questions I'm asking. Yeah. Not that you were, you know what I mean. Yeah, no, we're good. It's a big deal, right? <laughs> we're going to be at this another couple of weeks, and yeah. it's going to be a big deal every step of the way. Um, I have a question for you. With um, the absence of one of our committee members, should we defer and table the warrant process discussion? That would be my recommendation. Well, that sounds like a good recommendation. Thanks. So we are going to table item four and pick it up off the table at some other point. Hi. Good evening. Hi. My microphone works extra well. I'm noticing I'm blasting out to the universe <laughs> here. And 
You have to call me out, right? I know. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> she's arrived. Very, you're missed in every meeting that you're not at. So it's like, it, it's, uh, I am welcoming you. Thank you. Uh, so we went through the budget stuff. We went through, we're on item five. We're tabling item four because unfortunately Mr. Jonas couldn't be here. Okay. Um, on regional district advocacy, did you have anything you wanted to say about this? Yeah, I think I'd maybe just talk through two of the documents that were in the packet. If that's Great. okay, just very yeah. briefly. Um, so um, right after the ones that uh, Mr. Mangano spoke of earlier. So these, these are, I didn't write these. These are um, kind of coming through either regional school, um, one is from, the first one's from the Mass Association of Regional School Districts, um, and the second is, is coming a little bit from MASS and MASC, but let me stick to the first one first, because it's a little bit newer. Um, so um, this is, uh, was pretty shocking to many of us and who are working uh, in or for regional school districts. There was. A state auditor's report that came out, it was referenced at the 410 meeting, that um, one of the recommendations of the state auditor was to fully reimburse regional school district transportation. And um, unfortunately, it was level funded, which essentially involves a cut as more districts, especially charter schools, uh, identify themselves as regional school districts. The pie stays the same, but you know, it's not just that costs go up, it's actually that, that there's more people vying for that pie. Um, so uh, that is uh, something that um, MARS, which is Mass Association of Regional Schools, is trying to build advocacy for, is to increase that, perhaps not to 100%, because I think there's some sense of, I mean, even though this says this, um, there, there's some sense of there's an opportunity now because we have an official state uh, employee whose job it is to look at programs and identify solutions, identify one, and not only does it not met, it, it seems like in the governor's budget completely disregarded. Like not even, you know, putting it up um, to that level, but really reducing it in, in essence. So that was the first letter. The second letter, and there's been a lot of movement on this from, uh, frankly, from MASC as well, which is on special education circuit breaker. So to make a long story short, circuit breaker um, supports costs of students. Uh, when, the, the, when the cost of educating a student with special needs goes over a certain mark, the state reimburses some of those costs, um, and it's not being uh, reimbursed fully, and, and uh, this concern is that it's, it's the reimbursement's down to 65%, which is uh, low, especially given some of the other items in the governor's budget. So these are the two pieces of advocacy that uh, I wanted to bring you, because that's what I've been seeing around, go in superintendent circles, MASC, I was checking out their website, and some advocacy they're doing as well, um, just to frame the discussion. Mr. Um so for our district, um, have we hit circuit breaker? Um, we do get circuit breaker each year. I don't know if Dr. Brady or Sean wants to share. The regional schools get about six hundred thousand, five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars per year, and the elementary schools get about two hundred to three hundred thousand per year, depending on the, the needs. Thank you. And our regional transportation. Sorry to call you back up. In regional transportation. Yeah, uh, regional transportation, uh, we're budgeting 750000 in next year's budget. There's a chart um, in the budget book that shows what full funding would be. I think it's between two and $300,000 difference if we were fully funded versus the level we're currently funded in. Um, so there's certainly potential for much more reimbursement. But right now it's at 750000 So I guess what I'd offer is if there's a particular, uh, either of these or something else that you'd like me to draft a letter for the next meeting uh, for your consideration, I just wanted to get a sense from the committee where the committee sat, whether it's something the committee would like to pursue, one, both, neither. Um, I'm happy to do the work between now and the next meeting to draft something for your consideration. Uh, my answer would be yes. See lots of yeah. nodding heads. Okay. Lots of nodding heads. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, I also think that, um, what I would like to do um, is see if there are volunteers. I'm, uh, I suspect Mr. Demling would be a volunteer, although he's not here, so I'm not picking on him. But if there are volunteers of folks who'd like to um, sit down and put our heads together around how the school committee could organize its work on this subject, um, I think that would be uh, a good idea. Um, one is in terms of this kind of advocacy where there are letters and efforts 
where I think we should be, um, as, as we did in, in past years, um, be doing uh, advocacy at the State House. Also, one of the outcomes of um, the four town meeting to connect it back there again was the notion that um, some of the reforms that are in the state auditor's report, if fully implemented, or even some of them were implemented, would start to reframe and alleviate some of the tensions that exist between <coughs> our towns. In fact, actually, one of the observations of the Bumps report is, well, she doesn't pick on us, but the general observation is and that struck me in it was how much more alike we certainly are, or likely are, with other regional school districts that are facing fiscal pro and governance pressures than we are dissimilar. And so I think uh, it would be helpful for us to organize ourselves, but partially to organize ourselves so we could work more effectively <coughs> with um, other towns, the towns in our, other officials within the towns in our district, and then potentially with other regional school districts as well. And I think that would take a, you know, take a few hands to do that. Yeah. And I know Senator Rosenberg is aware of some of the issues that regional school districts are facing as right. well, um, just in terms of legislative. Uh, not that others aren't, but I know um, active conversations in the last couple of days. So I, I think so. what I can do as a follow-up, since not everyone's here, I also, I would suspect also Ms. Ardonias would be interested in this yeah. too. Um, I can, I can send an email out mm -hmm. to the full committee after this bring up the, the fact we discussed the topic. Mm -hmm. I think I'm similarly seeing sort of nodding heads here that whatever whatever the end result is, which would come back to the committee, um, you know, we should certainly do that. Mm -hmm. So you're drafting a letter. Two. I'll write two letters. Yeah. <laughs> I'll write I'll write a uh, email to the committee, and uh, and then I, I think what we do for the purposes of propriety is um, if we end up meeting, we'll post it as a public meeting so that. Um, instead of saying, oh, right. you're interested in helping too, well, now you can't because we'll have quorum, I'd rather just post a meeting and let people come. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Um, just want to comment when we redraft the letters. Um, I think we have different house representation based on the four towns here, so we should probably send letters to those representatives as well just to try to Absolutely. get a little more. Oomph. Oomph. <laughs> And one of them is on the, uh, I think, Ways and Means Committee. Yep. So not a bad person to have on this list. Great. Anything else on this subject? We're a model of efficiency this evening, I think. Right. Um, so now we can just take number six as it comes. Yep. And I'm going to turn to Ms. Cunningham, who's been working on a draft of, um, as we spoke last time, dra um, we're going to draft timeline of when um, when we'd have data, when we can be um, sharing responses to the goals that SETF shared with us. Okay. Right. So in your packets, I did um, put the SETF, SETF goals in there. And in bold, I just put the timeline that I believe we would be able to address it. Due to the data requests, I have to wait for them to come in and then um, respond to some of the items that are listed here. So for goal number one, we do have professional development that's taken place in March, and I'd like to also provide feedback on how that went, because it's going uh, for the whole district, including paras and, and secretaries, maintenance, transportation, all of, you know, everyone across the district would be involved in that professional development. So we're looking to address this goal and provide some information by the April 10th regional meeting. Goal number two, I have met with um, a member of the five colleges today, and she gave me a list of other higher ed professionals that I can meet with. I am looking to also meet with some guidance counselors to look at the courses that we are currently offering and look at some of our local high schools in Holyoke or Northampton or where have you to just find out what they're doing in reference to this and then um, have a plan ready and available by March 20th at that regional meeting. In addition, I'm looking to attend next week's SETF meeting so that I can possibly get some of the community members and some of the members of SETF to assist with that. 
goal number three, when we talk about the students and the enrollments in the AP and honors courses, that's another data request that has been sent out. And so I believe by the time we get that information and compile the list or the action plan that's being requested, that should be ready by May 8th for that regional committee uh, meeting. Goal number four is also a May timeline where additional data has been requested. And once I get that, I'd like to pull it all together again and um, address that at the May 22nd meeting. The last goal, which is more HR and you know the hiring and retention as we consistently talk about, I'm looking to have that or address that in our June meeting. That way I can get the longitudinal data that you're asking for and provide more updated information too. Any questions on that? That's great. That's very specific, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Anything? Thank you. Great. Um, number seven. Now, now we go from the specific. No, sorry, you. Actually, it wasn't super serious, but I see those cookies just sitting there. Is it okay, <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, oh, if I start that going around? I feel like it was a good pause they before we transition. They got here. Wow. <laughs> I don't want to do it Thank you for waiting. No, I think that's for, I think that's <laughs> very nice. We're just waiting for nice. Vera. <laughs> yes, uh, well, I was, I was you, you caught me in the middle of where I was going to make a joke that we're going from like a really specific response with specific dates and stuff like that to a discussion that's the theory, that's potentially very spongy <laughs> around, <laughs> around a new member orientation. Well, them first. Um, Doreen, have a cookie before. So, th I mean, this is obvious. All right, we'll take a let's cookie break. It's fine. You can wait until 9 o'clock, you know. <laughs> <else. Okay. laughs> yeah, after tasting those brownies last week. Yeah. Oh, this just looks spectacular. So, <laughs> for those at home, uh, I'm actually going to take two since obviously oh, yeah, please do. there's oh, yeah. not a lack of cookies here. They really look very nice. Are these chocolate chips? No, they're, they're oatmeal raisin. Oh, yeah. I love oatmeal raisin. <laughs> the raisins are good for you. Um, yeah, therefore, the whole cookie is So we, we discussed at our, our retreat um, do, having a, a new member orientation um, process as well as, you know, um, collateral material or, you know, things that we bring together to help orient folks. Um, and uh, I'm not really bringing this up to debate it, <laughs> since we've already discussed and agreed we needed to do it. It's one of those things where in a, in a challenging year where we've had lots of stuff to do, we're now at that point where I think on January 30th, if we do not organize ourselves to actually do this, we're going to start having new members on without having an actual process or packet together. So I guess one question, um, and I don't know if people's ability to do this are but do we have volunteers to help organize this process meaning at, not in our meeting but sort of offline yes I, I'm oh you are oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. and you're busy it's wonderful everyone's busy I know that but I just made you know. um, maybe need to be after the presentation next week and then I'll be able to okay <laughs> great um, any other? I'm happy to help. Like, if, if we want to divide out sections to draft and be able to bring back, I'm happy to, you know, divide um, longer. Is there a way that this could be done so that it could be discussed by a small group online without it needing to be a public meeting? I think that that's, if, if the challenge is the, the night meetings to get this work done, but if it can be done, you know, via Google Docs and stuff like that. Then we can be pretty effective. Is I there, think. Is there a way to do that with two? I think there is. With just, I mean, this is really, really. If, if what you're going to be doing is you're going to be compiling sort of rote information mm -hmm. that probably a lot of which we already have on hand um, to bring back to the committee's consideration around, you know 
what he wants to include in the packet. Mm -hmm. So I think if there's certainly if there's two men, two people, you could just work on it together. Th that's and it's not a subcommittee; okay. it's just it's a, subcommittee. a couple people working on something. So I think what because I, I thought about this some, and I, I think how I see it sort of playing out would be that a list is a list of here are the ideas of what we think would be great. Bring mm -hmm. that to the committee. Sort of have people add ideas, subtract ideas, and then go from there to start to compile. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Does anyone have any other ideas on it? That sounds great. Okay. Okay. Ms. Mary? So I assume that there wouldn't be any problem then with us just forwarding you guys' ideas that mm -hmm. we might have kind of jotted down over the course of you know, this. And literally to them, not to the group as a whole. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that is that is legitimate as long as we're not spinning out into, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And also I think we should avoid any debate or discussion. Right. Just so like if you have an item you think they should look at, just email them the item. Right. Don't editorialize on why you think it's important. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where you get into trouble. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. So yeah. uh, maybe I'll send out a reminder email about that yes. sometime in the near future. I okay. think that sounds great. Yeah. What's the phrase? We're cooking with gas. Hot grease. <laughs> Hot grease? Is that what it is? I don't know. <laughs> Hot grease. Biodiesel. Whatever. <laughs> Debbie, did you have this some is, cookies? Yeah. I did not. Oh, oh my goodness. Down. <laughs> I mean, take two. Yeah. 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 Take two. We have to yeah. pass them back. <laughs> <laughs> That's just an excuse. The, 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 um, <laughs> Sorry, that was out of order. <laughs> no, it's okay. That, that'll, be, uh, no, that'll be a great... Great thing to get going. Um, so that would put us on school committee. Pro hey, in a related notion, <laughs> remember when we all agreed we we're going to have school committee protocols that updated? Spirit. I do remember that. You look great. Um, so everyone has a, a draft document um, that was passed out tonight. And I think you should have received it <laughs> a few hours ago. <laughs> um, so I guess I can just give a little bit of history about where this came from. Um, you probably remember, I took some uh, various sample protocols from other school committees and kind of compiled a, a big list and sent it around. And then I got feedback from some members about things that they think were important to include. Um, and so that's basically what this is. I've kind of tried to put it together in a way that makes sense. Um, and some feedback that was quite similar, I kind of, you know, eliminated overlap and did a little bit of light kind of, you know, editing in that way. Um, and I left the, the things in bold are things that more than one, I got feedback from more than one person that they thought was important to include in the protocols. And um, at the very end, there were a few things that um, people had indicated that they they liked that other, and this is these are things that other school committees put in their their protocols, but that we that has they have significant overlap with what's in our ethics policy. So from my perspective, I pulled those out because I think we can we can make a decision one way or the other whether we think it's sufficient to have it in the ethics policy and we don't need to duplicate it here. I mean, people could make another case, but that's why those are kind of pulled out. But I left them in just so you can see what those were. Um, since you didn't have this very far in advance, I don't know if people feel. Like they have uh, had enough time to offer any thoughts on this particular document, um, or what the best way to proceed is at this point. Um, I, my my assumption was we'd bring it forward next meeting okay. for a vote, and then that would focus the mind around whether folks have any edits or changes they have. But if obviously people have questions or comments now, they should make them if they have them. I liked it. By the way, yeah. that was good. Wor good work, and, and I thought um, uh, I could see the evolution compared to the previous draft, where before it was more of sort of a pastiche of different things. Here, I think there's a there's obviously a excellent coherence and consistency. Oh, Mr. Cage. I was going to say the same. Like from the draft version to this version, it seems perfect to me. Um, and the only thing that I would um, note is um, how we conduct meetings, the first sentence, um, that it's not a public meeting. 
um, maybe to be clear um, that it's open for the public to attend. It's an open meeting. It's it's you know it's open to the public um, to attend, not necessarily to um, deliberate with us. Do, do you know Do you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. it's it does it is a public meeting. I think. Yeah. So I. I was, I think this, you know, I didn't read it, I didn't pick up on it the first time you read it, but now, right when you started looking at that sentence, I think the word that strikes me is, like, without getting, it uses the word meeting three times in the, right, in the <laughs> sentence, and, and I know that's intentional, but it also makes it perhaps not as clear, and, and what I hear of what you're saying is that when it says it's not a public meeting, I think the intent is to say it's not a public hearing where there's dialogue back and forth, but it is, a, I mean, I get what they were saying a public meeting. I also have a hard time thinking that this isn't a public meeting. Being videotaped, there's a chance for public comment. Right? It's not like there's a back and forth. But I want to acknowledge that point that I'm not sure that's the right. Well, I think as a practical matter, right. it absolutely is a public meeting. Right. Like legally, practically, right. and in any other way, it's obviously a public right. meeting. Right. I mean, it, it clearly is trying to find a synonym to, I don't know, like an uh, a town hall, like an right. open and deliberative meeting with inviting the public, public hearing. I mean, it's clearly that's what they're trying to say. You know, I think other things I've read have said that it's like it's a business meeting of the school yeah. committee. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't sound too narrow or procedural. So, Amanda Cage? Um, I think how we govern the first page, it talks about the role of the chair. Maybe that should be a distinct um, subtitle or, um, un you know, un under uh, heading because the chair would have the discretion to um, to recognize members of the public to speak um, at any point of the meeting. It's, it's really, that's a chair's, I think, role and responsibility to, to view when that's appropriate. <laughs> um, regarding the comment about the um, public meeting, you know, we can always decide that we don't feel like we even need that statement in here. So I don't know if people feel strongly that they want something acknowledging that in here and just for me to work on, you know, improving the language so it's clear. It's a good thing to keep it in. Keep it in, okay. Sullivan? Mm -hmm. like I'm watching tennis, so I'm going to go back and forth. Um, okay. Okay. So you will revise it, and I'll then we'll get, a, we'll get another revised version before the meeting with the note that next time, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a vote if the committee is interested in having a vote. So, right? I'm sorry. Is that I was just going to say, if we have further comments, just because I actually didn't have time to read it before the meeting, can we send them? Of course. You can, yeah. Yeah, so maybe um, I could just send out an email give people a week and then have a deadline for comments mm -hmm. so that I can have a draft for people to review that's not going to change between a certain point in the meeting. That's really important, actually, I think. Okay. That's really important. All right. I will do that. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so item eight is now done. Um, we're now on item nine, superintendent evaluation Update. This is distinct, by the way, from Superintendent Goals Item 10. Sure, if you want. Um, so, as requested by the school committee at our last meeting, I reached out to our attorney, Mark Terry, um, and sort of explained um, what we were looking for, or our, our questions around um, who we might, who would be asked and and requested to uh, complete the superintendent evaluation because there's been some question about um, if members come on and they've only been on for two or three months before the evaluation is completed, is it appropriate for, the, for them to complete it given they haven't been part of the goal cycle? And, and for members who have been, ha, who were part of the goal setting cycle and then stepped off a few months before the evaluation, should they be asked to complete the evaluation? And this is based on you know some precedence of how things have been done before. And so 
is up just giving a recap so everyone remembers where we are. And so um, the superintendent evaluation, or mem a few members had, had sort of drafted up a, a, a thought about how that, what we might look, we, well, after speaking with um, members of MASHC, um, we put out a proposed possible protocol for how we might do that. And there was a question about if we're restricting people who are sitting on the committee from evaluating the superintendent, is that legal? Could that be, um, could that be challenged? And also, if we're asking people who are no longer sitting on the committee to fill out the evaluation, could that also be challenged? Which was a really good question. I think Ms. Duane Cage brought that up. So. Um, it was a really good question, so thank you. And um, so Mr. Terry um, responded um, with some sort of interesting information. So can I, I'm just going to read something sure. I wrote back. He wrote, he, so he wrote, as a matter of law, only committee members in office at the time of the evaluation process have the legal right to participate. There is nothing that stops former committee members from completing an evaluation document, but those documents should not be given any official weight because the person writing them has no right to vote on the final official evaluation. Um, okay. So as, I, as such, I recommend any documentation created by a former committee member, whether positive or negative, be offered to the superintendent for his personal reflection and or follow-up. Further up, further, I'd recommend that such communication be created judiciously and only when a former committee member truly feels this is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, the communication should be offered verbally. Um, okay, there's more, but I'm going to try to limit it here. Uh, okay, that said, each committee member must ensure that the evaluation document reflects his or her own thinking and is not a proxy for comments offered by non-committee members. So this is an issue, he said, in many districts. Um, but it's more substantial for us given our election cycle. So he gave us a couple of thoughts of how to move forward. So he said, I think the best way to handle this is to make the review cycle consistent with your election cycle. <laughs> 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 I do the evaluation two weeks before your elections. Okay, so that was one suggestion. It's a nice suggestion. <laughs> it's a nice suggestion. <laughs> um, another, let's see. If the committee wants to adjust the goal evaluation calendar to align with this election cycle, we'd at least have to review Mike's contract to see if it's permissible or not. I mean, there's this whole contract issue, obviously, if we were to go somewhere in that direction. So two, another approach is to adopt a committee practice by which only those who have served, for example, at least six months may have their evaluations count for the purposes of the official evaluation. Anyone newer than that could and should complete an evaluation based on their experience as a member of the committee as compared to their experience as a citizen, but their evaluations would not be considered for the purpose of developing the composite document or establishing the ratings. Technically, they could still object to a composite evaluation because we cannot take their vote away from them, but a well-established practice in this regard is helpful. The committee could codify this practice in a committee policy as well. Um, and he's saying that a stronger commitment to the same approach as the second would be to include language in the superintendent's contract to make the same commitments. Um, this would create an enforceable contextual commitment as compared to a practice or a policy that could be followed or changed. So, and by my recollection, when uh, not so good. My, my recollection when you shared it though was that, um, in addition to, for want of a better way of phrasing it, the lack of standing of a former committee member to fill out an evaluation. Similarly, a new member, once they're sworn in, has all the rights, responsibilities, and powers of any other school committee members so that even though, you, as you were saying, he said we, we could adopt a policy of weighting differently the input of a new member. In fact, that new member would have a full legal right to vote and debate the evaluation, right? Uh, I mean, that I'm a little, I think that's a question that needs to be asked because okay. here he's saying that we could create that policy However, if you're saying that they have the legal right, I, I, I guess I'm sort of questioning how you could put that in a contract if it was, in fact, against the law. I mean, I, I don't know. That's why, that's why I, 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 in, in so, all honesty, that's why I was bringing it up, because yeah. I saw that as an internal <laughs> um, contradiction. I, I agree, yeah. <laughs> I interpreted that separately, saying if you had a policy and you, and, and you did it that way, we all sit at the table and we have to all vote for the superintendent's evaluation. And so if, you had, if I had been a new member and you refused to accept my input, I still have a vote to say that's not my evaluation, right? I, I, I don't vote in favor of the summative evaluation because it did not consider my opinion. Yeah. That's how I read that's, his I words. Think that sounds right. Maybe I misinterpreted, but 
no, all, the, all city members still are still going to vote. No, the, on I the, think that makes sense to yes, me. I think right, I think right. the question yeah. ends up being, right. it's kind of a funny. It's an extension, natural extension of that, is that if you're if you're going to the point that somebody has the right to to vote and debate the final evaluation, then. Not sound funny about this, but why are you bothering to <laughs> exclude their ability to write an evaluation? Because it seems like you're creating more trouble than it's worth. Since once they're on, they're legally on. They have the rights mm -hmm. of anyone who's on. Um, you're, you know, it, it would be to me. I'm sorry, I'm going into like a discussion of this by offering my opinion. It would make more yeah. sense to figure out how to reorient the calendar, the evaluation. I mean, going back to the original point, the only solution that makes any real sense is reorganizing the evaluation calendar so that it lines up at the end before the elections and then you don't have this problem, right? But we have four towns that have four. different election cycles. So you have to pick the first one and have it be before the first one. And my committee could reorganize at any time. Why would you want to do that? And <laughs> somebody else could step onto this committee, right? I mean, it happens. I ha we had a chair step down, we had to reorganize. And that doesn't guarantee me this position back on the regional school committee. It's, there's not a big line of people waiting to take this volunteer job oh, away yeah. from me, but. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for her to finish, Mr. Menino. I saw your hand. Mr. Menino. What's wrong with the process we followed in the past where the committee suggested that because I was a new member, I might not wish to participate in the vote, and I declined to participate? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Sorry, Ms. Marion. Yeah, and I think to that end, um, we could agree what our recommendation would be to new members so that, you know, some people's not, you know, so that we're, we're on the same page as far as what our recommendation is, and it doesn't, of course, change a new member's right to do what they want. Um, as far as the calendar, I mean, I agree. You, you might not be able to, you know, prevent any weird blip of new members coming on at awkward times, but if, if, if um, past members aren't participating, and all new members are, I think it gets really awkward balance of, <laughs> as it currently stands, who, you know, what the evaluation is based on. So I agree that we should try and do some kind of adjustment to rectify that. Okay. I, I like the idea. I just don't, I mean, if we set goal. I'm, I'm just trying to think if you set goals. It makes sense to set goals at the beginning of the school year when the work begins and the contract year starts. Election cycles happen in April, starting in April for town meetings, right? March. March, actually. For March, us. April. It, it's, it seems like not enough time for a superintendent to have made significant progress on a goal between, let's say the committee is really good and gets out of the gate and approves goals in September, to get to March isn't a lot of the school year. and. You know, there are many times when the situation is that we don't approve goals until winter time, and I think that's going to be a challenge. Might I offer, offer no, a sure. Not. We're so, not deciding anything right now. We're yeah, just yeah. surfacing the issue and discussing it. Absolutely. And, and Ms. Hazard shared the email with me, so I'm aware of the context in full disclosure. Um, so I think a couple of things. One is I think now that I'm in a, in a more permanent situation, a permanent situation. Um, I think thinking about whether goals are one year or they're multi-year sort of matters about when, what the timeline is. Um, I know there are districts that actually right upon the end of the cycle in June try to have a, like that's when they do the retreat and do some um, goal setting for the future year so that it's not like evaluation ends and come back and then September, right? Like it, theoretically those, those two things, the processes would be linked, right? You, evaluation ends, goal setting, right? Because it should be this went well, these are things we should work, you should work on. Okay, how am I going to contextualize that? So um, I, I do think there's some dialogue that, that I think uh, I'd be happy to participate in on that topic. I think the second thing in terms of the six months and, and that piece, I think um, this is where it gets complicated because let's say, right, so there's a May, let's say it's a May town meeting. There's a change and the evaluation process essentially is like a one month process for which maybe there's two meetings in uh, for a school committee member and then to come up with a, an evaluation that doesn't take into account anything that happened before they were a school committee member. They may have been an interested member of the public, but 
that can't contribute. It really has to be in the role. I think it just it sets up a dynamic among superintendents, school committee members that's awkward, and and if it's possible to avoid, I think it's worth avoiding on, on a number of counts. I mean, uh, you know, you could think of positive examples where it's too positive, or negative examples where it's too negative. But I think just uh, building an evaluation on a month's work. It makes no sense, and, and so trying to think of ways, I think that's why Mr. Terry was thinking of six months or trying to quantify that, um, and then in the contract as well as in, you know, school committee policy. To me, that makes logical sense. I think, you know, uh, I agree that the best solution would be um, figuring out a different timeline. I think, you know, not to be awkward about it, but we have to see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. I think we'll know better the answer to that question two months from now. Um, as of right now, I mean, I could imagine a scenario where they line up reasonably well, but, you know, Amherst, I'm not saying anything that people don't know, just to be transparent about it, Amherst is considering one change that would have an influence on when the election cycles would be, which would make it sort of inconceivable to reconcile cycles between the four towns. Sorry, that was a whole lot. But That's funny, actually, because in, in my mind, if if the charter passed, and new members came on in the fall. Like, right. in, I, I don't know how that works, but I'm assuming if there's a November election, the new members start in December or something. They don't start in January. Um, I don't know how that works. I don't know how it's written. But um, if that were the if that were the case, sorry. No, is that true? Are you I, I was reading it and I was confused. Oh, oh, interesting. So, and so that's an open question. question. But yeah. I was just going to say that to my mind, I would find it less problematic. To have superintendent evaluations in late April, early May, whenever it needs to be, right. you know, to sync up with um, Pelham, Lebert, and Shutesbury. Right. If the Amherst members had been in place, you know, for even seven or eight months, yeah, I'm like, whatever, true. deal with it, re up. Yeah. Right. You know, so you have seven, you have eight months to evaluate them. Right. That's not too bad. Yeah. The really hard part is doing what we were describing mm -hmm. earlier, which is if mm -hmm. the charter doesn't pass, and we're 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 in the mode, of, the current mode of saying. Ideally, we'd be doing evaluations <laughs> in the beginning of March right, yeah. when we're trying to pass the budget, <laughs> which sounds kind of stupid. Yeah, they use a you know very casual and earthy phrase. Right, um, that doesn't sound like the world's greatest thinking. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So today, I guess we'll stay tuned. Or so. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'm thinking is that I could follow up and sort of get some real clarification around this question that we had. Um, and then, I mean, I think Ms. Marriott's idea of even if we can't make it official, making a sort of an accepted recommendation, mm -hmm. recognizing that we can't, um, you know, we can't actually infringe on a voted official, mm -hmm. a voted elected official's rights, um, maybe bring something like that back, some language around that. Sure. Does that sound like a place, the next step. To I think as Mr. Media pointed out, that's actually what we did. That is actually in the end what we did last, last spring. Where we're, I'm not, I don't know who else would have been, but I know Mr. Mr. Demling Mr. and yeah. Mr. Renino. I think we both accused ourselves. But you had every right to, yeah. and you were offered. The I wasn't right. offended. No, no, but I mean, but you just mean. <laughs> I just remember you had every right to do it. You recorded every right, but we also had a practical conversation about, you know, how much time you had to be able to deliberate, and you know that worked through. And. I mean, yeah. I, th I think that you know, possibly of more consequences is that people, of more consequences that people who have sat for ten months of the cycle will no longer be permitted to complete an evaluation. That uh, yeah, that's, be that's, a, that's, that's a big, a big, that's a big change. I consider big that change. I consider that a much bigger loss, to be honest with you. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's of more yeah. consequence to actually yeah. how yeah. the evaluation. And that's actually that's right. actually the reason why, in my mind, I kept thinking we've got to find a way to move the cow, mm -hmm. regardless. Reorganization mm -hmm. hiccups. That's why, in my mind, we ought to move the calendar up in a way so that it syncs up with when most numbers are. Because um, um, you guys have a lot, since I know the members who might be here who are not going to be here after the town elections. You have a lot to offer, and I think our superintendent would benefit from hearing from you. Agreed. It's my opinion, anyways. Okay. Um, superintendent, go. Are we okay? I see nodding. Superintendent, by the way, we're racing ahead of our normal time of schedule. So people are upset by that. Yeah, Eat more cookies, cookies <laughs> raise points of order. We can kill at least an hour doing all that. Um, Superintendent goals. 
feels a little funny doing it right after that last conversation <laughs> about timelines and should these be three months? Well, I just I want to I want yeah. you to know that we're anticipating you submitting your portfolio of accomplishments <laughs> um, around three weeks from now. So, Sounds good. Uh, Added to the budget hearing. Um, good luck with that. <laughs> so um, there's a newer version than what it was emailed to you. It's it is front and back. So just making sure everyone has the update. I got some excellent feedback today, and there's one thing to add that I didn't get to add in the text, but I'll add as I share them. Um, so thank you for those of you who are quick on the email. Um, so these were adjusted from, oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask you one question? Yeah, please. Is our, is our goal and our hope that we discuss this tonight and then vote them on the 13th? They were originally presented at the last meeting. These are the yeah. revised goals. So yeah. I think if the committee is comfortable voting tonight, that'd okay. be fine. Well, it won't set me back any if it ends up being the 13th. Um, this is ongoing work, but um, that'd be for the committee to decide. Okay, well, I just wanted, that's yeah. wanted to frame the conversation out. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Somebody catch? Um, I, I would like for um, Anastasia and the other committee members um, that aren't here to be part of the vote, if possible, if we could do that next. My, my thoughts. That feels better to me, too. Thank you. Yeah. I have no objection. Okay. Well, just not to sound funny about this, but I, our conversations are always sort of organized differently if we're racing to a point where we're voting yeah. and when we're discussing and giving feedback. And so that's why I was framing it out at the beginning. Absolutely. But I also appreciate they gave Stormy Cage an opportunity to and all in us to think about it. Yep. So um, we, it, with everyone's speak now, because otherwise, I'm going to assume we're not voting tonight, and we're going to give Mr. Demling and Ms. Ordonez an opportunity to vote next time. I have no objection. Okay. So, sorry, jump ahead. Sure. I'll be brief. Um, so, these are revised. One of the pieces of feedback was um, a request from a school committee member to add explicit connections to last year's goals, which I thought was an excellent suggestion. Uh, a couple other suggestions that you'll notice minor changes from was emailed. The one feedback piece I'll do orally because I forgot to do it in the writing, I apologize. Um, I know I sent them out late. Uh, was just identifying which of the goals are professional practice goals, which of the goals are student learning goals, and which are related to the um, kind of district improvement plan or what we're, we're talking about district goals. And so uh, I'll, just, I'll just briefly mention them. Uh, number one, I didn't get much feedback on, um, so it, it's mostly unchanged. But what you'll notice from last time is um, Ms. Marriott rightly noted that I should be linking these to standards and um, indicators. So those are listed on all the goals afterwards. And I would say this is a professional practice goal uh, around communication. It's obviously connected to last year's, but I do think it's tightly connected to the rubric and, and fully supportive of, uh, of something I'm working on and, and just as an organization I'm leading. The second goal uh, was kind of combined. You remember there was a couple goals really connected, and that was some of the feedback. So I, I tried to reword, um, actually, um, goals two and goals four. Um, there used to be multiple. There used to be more goals, and trying to connect those. Um, and this would be part of uh, what I would consider the district improvement plan, the district's work, uh, which is around the strategic planning process, um, which I think will kick off. The plan right now is to kick off in March. So budget process ends, and then we can get going with that. So it doesn't get intermingled with budget processes, given the year that we're having. The third one, uh, I also would consider a professional practice goal, um, which is around the budget challenges. So I think we've spoken enough about budget in the last eight days. Um, I mean, certainly I'll take feedback, but I don't think I need to reiterate anything that's on there. Um, the fourth goal, um, I would also see in the district uh, as a district goal. Um, Doreen talked about a little bit earlier um, tonight, which is really around both engaging, and she talked about SETF in particular, but there's also staff, um, stakeholder groups um, that are actively a part of this um, training this March, and then also using that as a kickoff uh, to really be planning and thinking ahead to next year to a series of regular um, growth opportunities for our staff in the area of social justice. So um, we do want to focus because March is a big date in terms of a kickoff, but it's not a kickoff for like kickoff and then the year ends. It's really kickoff for a multi-year plan and trying to gather that feedback from that event and how it goes. Um, it's hard during a planning, for, you know, we're talking about today, just an aside, 400 staff who are all incredibly dedicated, excited to do this work, and all in really different places, right? And we think about differentiating professional development on a whole host, right? You wouldn't do, like, kindergarten, if you're doing reading, you wouldn't, like, put 
the same people together and, and in this regard. So we're, we're actually trying to break some new ground of how we think about social justice professional development and offering differentiating both by um, interest level and experience level. So um, the work's really exciting and important. And, um, and again, we want to do things right this spring to set the stage for the future work. Um, mm -hmm. And the last one is um, on the student learning front. Um, I titled it that way because it says school climate, but it's asking questions about stress level, homework, um, feeling connected to school. You know, one of the best indicators of student uh, performance is um, two questions. One is, do you have an adult that you can trust to talk to when things aren't going your way? Right, huge correlation to um, lots of positive and negative things depending on how students respond. <coughs> Excuse me, and and also asking very explicitly um, about how they experience their their school environment because everyone's reality is different, and, and understanding that their demographic differences and disaggregating is incredibly important to understand um, how different students are understanding those experiences. So, I saw that one as directly linked to student learning. It's not like an MCAS goal, um, mm -hmm. but uh, for me, I, I saw the linkage. So I didn't write those. District improvement plan, student learning, professional practice, things on there, but I wanted to say them orally. Um, mm -hmm. So next time I'll come with a cleaner copy that way. Mr. Cage? So the work that you've been doing, um, engaging with community around like dual language, is it dual language um, or enrollment working group and all those different groups, where do you see that fitting in here? So on Monday night, we're at the Amherst School Committee. I'll talk a lot about that. Um, okay. But I, since it's been it's, so specific to Amherst and not, you, didn't, you know, it's funny, okay. someone asked a question today about <laughs> it's that. It's all they blurred. Said, <laughs> Jeff's, Jeff's here, no, trust me, for me as well. Uh, you know, so one of the enrollment working group people said, are the regional members getting to hear this? Because whatever the mm -hmm. outcome is in Amherst, it's 75 80% of the students, it has an impact on the secondary school. So I appreciate that, because uh, the dual language actually is, mm -hmm. someone asked, what are we doing with that? I said, well, Group's going to present on Monday, and we'll go from there. And they said, "What are the implications on seventh grade?" And I said, "Well, we're, you know, we're not quite there yet, but I think uh, I think it's an important point you're raising about what are the connections between the districts and potential changes that that we're talking about. Even the summit move, right? Thinking about mm -hmm. once kids go from sixth to seventh grade, as we're thinking about uh, long term, whether there's a place at summit for seventh and eighth graders, what does that actually drill down to the elementary school programming that we have? So. Um, I, I think it's, it's a really good point, but I think at this point that work has been much more focused at the elementary level. It's, this is, pro um, forgive me for jumping in on this because I know it's not, it's indirectly related to goals and goals of different committees. Um, that um, when we were talking earlier about the SCTF goals, um, and I think we might have talked about this in your office a little while ago, that when you think about opening up exposure and utilization of advanced placement and other enriched um, intensive academic experiences at an advanced level. Um, if you're looking at the entire student population, um, not just particular demographics, but the entire student population, and you think, I want to impact the accessibility and utilization of these courses by all students, knowing that maybe all students aren't going to be ready to, but you want to open the aperture up in terms of the students you're accepting, I think common sense, or not common sense, data, your favorite thing, research and data, <laughs> um, tell you that yeah. if you're not focusing from preschool and kindergarten and first and second grade, then by the time you get to someone who's at 10th grade and is thinking, <laughs> what am I going to take this year, or 11th grade, what am I going to take this year, um, there are going to be some, undoubtedly there are some students who, given the, the the proper en encouragement environment or pre-courses between, you know, 8th and ninth and 10th and 11th grade, they absolutely can take advantage of it. So I'm not, saying it, I'm not saying it truncates all the population, but it's undoubtedly true that if you really said your goal was to expand the accessibility to enriched um, ac academically rigorous courses for the entire student body to the extent they're able to, you'd in fact be integrating, you know, K6 and 712 thinking. Right? I Ab assume. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, this is not a critique of the goal setting process or how we set it up, but it does, you know, to Ms. Tromini Cage's point, it does sometimes feel awkward because there, there are unique, you right. know, I'm thinking of Pell in particular, both the last two years have some unique uh, goals at the same time. They're all our students, and I don't, I don't, you know, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I'm not like, oh, this is my 3% Pelham or the 54% region, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's our students, and, and um, 
So I get why, you know, there's this process by which we have different districts, and I'm not going down a regionalization discussion. Um, <laughs> Nor is this, I, by the way. Right. <laughs> um, at the same time, you know, it, it, parsing it out this way, uh, there, there are implications. And functionally, we work, I mean, at an educational level, when we have principals meetings, I have seven principals there, right? It's not like I have, you know, unless it's a budget one, like tomorrow, where we do have to separate it. But even then, we have some crossover time, because what the implications of budget decisions at elementary and at the secondary level, Right, there's a lot of um, interplay in the elementary teacher. Uh, elementary schools sometimes have a lot to say about the secondary and vice versa, and, and that's a really healthy thing. So I appreciate the, the quick Still discussion. Other, are there other? Um, I just have a quick quick. You jog my memory when we're you're going through this. Um, the student climate survey for next year did that survive the budget? Student. So yeah, goal five. So what we, the actual? Yeah, I mean. So we not the goal, the actual not the survey. Goal, so. But the actual survey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when we went to the conference in um, the Challenge Success Conference in the fall, we're utilizing part of what they offered us at that conference is their survey, which they use on hundreds of schools, and we've um, the the principals have all adapted it, you know, with teacher feedback on to work for them. So there's no cost. The, well, the cost is already connected to the conference. Uh, we're not using the same survey that was done a couple years ago. So for not, the, not the 2015, so exactly. sorry, Rick, we're going to start all over again and but create here, a new data point. Right. I think I think the, the key phrase on this one is this annual practice, right, on that goal. So cool. that, you know, I, I understand the concerns that one might have about not doing that survey. Um, and, and I think there's critiques there. I think there's critiques of the survey. Um, but for me, we have to do something that's sustainable. And I like that we took a national survey and the principals worked with teachers at, you know, one a staff meeting, one a small group meeting of mental health folks, and have made it our own. And, and now our cost is, is uh, at the resource is time, not money, which I think is more sustainable. Will the survey be the same? For multiple years? Yeah, that's the idea. So that we, you know, what we all want is have five years. I mean, my, you know, we we're on the, I think I might have told the story. I apologize if I did. So we're on the, we're on the traveling back, and um, there's a principal from another school in sort of 495 area, and he had 10 years of climate dirty survey. And Mr. Jackson and I were like drooling, <laughs> you know, because that's really what you want to have. Because if you have only one year, you're getting the snapshot that's valuable. But what's really valuable is we have this data. We use it, we inform our practice, we then get more snapshots, and we actually see trends over time. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Carmen Um Rick Hood is probably <laughs> raising his hand. And for good reason. I mean, yes. but his, his points are true, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I mean, he said it about multiple factors, you know, not just the climate. is. One data point is one data point. What we're really looking for is trends and seeing how we're doing over time so that it actually informs our practice. It doesn't just become this dangling data point. Well, that's the, that's the wonderful connection to the earlier one around um, district improvement plan. And I think I'm, I'm going to note out loud that you, by identifying CPAC and SCTF, are talking about developing a strategy in which those other priorities or elements or um, questions people have around the quality of our service are all integrated into the common plan. It's not like there's a series of disparate plans sitting out there, or even worse, that we have the district's plan and then we have other special plans. Right. The entire point is it's all integrated and cohesive and hopefully self-reinforcing. That's right. And then if we do that right, mm -hmm. then the climate survey becomes, as well as periodic and regular CPAC surveys, become super valuable because they're reflecting back on a strategic plan that's being implemented, developed, but then implemented. So, um, you know, I so when when process question or a timeline question, when would you do the mid-year report for this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know when the evaluation's happening. So <laughs> it's hard for me yeah. to judge. Um, I won't be here probably for that. <laughs> I'm sad March. about that, but. Um, do we have two Maybe it's a good March? Do we have two meetings in March? We, we, have, a Mar we have a March 20th meeting, right? Yeah. I wonder if that can be, since there's not a tremendous amount of feedback I'm hearing to date on the actual goals, yeah. can we actually, if we have this in the agenda for the next meeting, could we have that? I think it's an important question. Yeah, I agree. And I think we could then highlight, okay, if we're going to, if there's going to be approval of the goals, 
on February 13th, how do we want to map out the rest of the process? Because I, yeah. I think the mid-cycle is one of them, but I think there's actually other key dates that we should probably map sure. out, like backwards on the process is going to end this date and when do these things need to happen. Well, and not to sound um, perverse about this, but uh, we, we, have to make, we have to map it out in such a way that we don't actually approve the final evaluation instrument after we've had all of our votes, elections in town meetings. I think there's a possibility, I mean, there's a theoretical construct in which basically we might have like six or seven new members and like, you know, two or three current members and, you know, seriously, yeah. I think we'd want to avoid that if we could. Not to sound dumb, wow. uh, Ms. Merritt. Um, this is kind of also around um, process yeah. and thinking about, you know, we've done some thinking as a committee about um, strengthening our process in general and so um, compared to last time uh, I if I'm I didn't get a chance to look at this ahead of time yeah, but I'm sorry um, about that. no no sorry. not at all um, you you've listed some kind of um, I guess outputs or would you call it like some of the objectives right of, of, of the of the work um, and I think what's which would be nice for us to do, and again, this is a weird year, it's, the process is short, but for us as a group with the superintendent then to come to a consensus about what success looks like yeah. on each of these mm -hmm. and what, um, what we're hoping be, you know, to achieve overall by doing this, right? What we hope the, the outcome will be and then how do we evaluate that, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, you can, you can, successfully do all of these goals and then to that achieve the desired you know effect and I, so I think consensus among us about what the desired effect is what it looks like and then how we mm -hmm. not that that I mean I just I think it's a good exercise in general for us to be engaging in so That's final comments Sorry, on this topic yeah, sure. um, so I I don't know um, if this would be an interesting or acceptable um, offer from school committee members to um, suggest some of, some of the evidence um, that you could share you know you can talk about or present um, you know because I, I think the new things like the IBB process um, probably could fit in goal one in terms of like the labor management you know practice that you're you know trying to develop with the association um, <clears throat> also you know the the, your committee work outside, um, like with Mars and yeah. with the rural sc um, school committee, school right. network or whatever. Um, Riot, yeah. And your work with the racial imbalance right. um, committee. So I think those are good highlights to sort of present as, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to consider. I think that fits into the what do we feel success looks like for these, right? So those are certainly like, that's what our expectation would be for something like this. And I think it informs us and helps us understand the goal better and hopefully informs you too in terms of what kind of evidence we're looking for and what, and, and facilitate that discussion about what is a reasonable success look, look like in the time frame that we have. And I think that's helpful. Does it make sense to, to put that as part of the agenda next week prior to approving the girls? Yep. I mean, that way we could get all the members of the committee to, mm -hmm. to think about that mm -hmm. for next for the next meeting. I was just saying that's not next. It's actually for once. It's not next <laughs> week. <gonna> <laughs> <laughs> it's throwing me off kilter here. It's yeah. actually two weeks from now. Yep. Um, I think that'd be I think that would be a good idea. Um, and it's interesting because I think what it would inform potentially inform also is that as we get our structure set for the remainder of, of this current cycle. I think it would be valuable, again, to do something we talked a little bit about last year of setting up an initial calendar for next year, at least a draft calendar mm -hmm. for next year, because I actually kind of agree with you, um, Superintendent, that in a perfect world, given the idea that you want your annual goals to be aligned with, especially, I mean, for you in particular, more than anyone else, your goals should correspond to sort of goals we have for the district for the year or even multi-year goals um, that I don't think there's anything wrong with the idea 
that there could be some retreat or discussion, not in August, but at the beginning of the summer rather than the end, and that it could that, that could lead to an approval of goals that have already been discussed and started to be worked up, even as the beginning of the first meeting of the next year. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself. My point is, sim by the same sort of logic, because then that would line up basically your goals, how you're being evaluated with, with a, a stronger conception of, you know, when all the teachers show up again in the fall, you're you're already essentially working on your goals for the year, right? Absolutely. And, and if you didn't work on them over the summer, you can't do it in the end of August, right? Exactly. I mean, so as a practical matter, we're start we'd be starting to line up the calendar better <clears throat> with when um, you've really started afresh to say, you know, what on earth do I want to start doing this coming year, and how does it relate and stuff like that? Yeah, it'd be, and I, I I'll just say historically one of the challenges that's not personalized to any superintendent is that when the goals get set in the fall, right, that's, I mean, in terms of leadership and principals knowing what the goals are, for, you know, it's just all those things, right, they've already got their day, their schedules, and, and so I think if there was any way to have it sooner where that could be the lead-in for administrative tweeting week in August, right, if it's always been juxtaposed sort of awkwardly, it's no one's fault, you know, yeah. um, but if we could break that cycle, I think it would actually really have, it would have a significant impact on district functioning. Cool. All right. So anything else on this topic? And I say that not only because we're running currently 55 minutes ahead of schedule. It's like, Let's keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost not possible, is it? Um, so at the back of your books, we actually have gifts from um, this meeting, which is kind of cool. So. Um, Who's going to speak up to read the gifts and make the motion? I mean, out loud. Read them out loud. <laughs> I can. I can. <laughs> I can. Um, we have donor Marshall and Annie Jones to support James Faison's scholarship in the amount of $250. We have donor Anonymous um, to support Student Act repair and replacement of swim equipment in the amount of $2,000. We have donor Jones Group Realtors uh, to support 2018 scholarship in the amount of $500. We have donor Anna Anthony Reynolds Senior Memorial Fund to support 2018 Anthony Reynolds Senior Memorial Scholarship in the amount of $500 for a grand total of $3,250. So move to accept those gifts. Is there a second? second? It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Comments? Seeing none. All those in favor of accepting those gifts, raise your hand. Carries unanimously. Um, in the in the um, floating agenda that you have, meaning not the one that's stapled, but the one that's not stapled, um, I think we're already starting to create other things that we have on our future agenda. I mean, among them, superintendent goals, superintendent evaluation. Um, Do you want me to read? I think I've got a compiled list if it's helpful. Beyond, with the, beyond the four that are in front yeah. of us? Okay, go for it. So I've got um, FY19 um, budget hearing. Um, and just as a reminder, I mean, it's the chair's discretion, but in typically that uh, involves sharing of a budget and then an opportunity for public comment after the budget has been shared as opposed to typical meetings where feedback happens at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's up to the chair's discretion. but. I think historically it's it's positioned the comments to be more informed by the dialogue that people hear. So that'd be my recommendation. But of course, I'll be flexible with whatever you want. You're silly. <laughs> You're like, it's like we could do it the smart way or we could do it the stupid way. <laughs> it's like, do you want to do it the smart just, way or the stupid these way? These cookies got me all. And it's like, because, so you know, <laughs> I'm like, all right, Mike, I think we should do it the smart way. I think it'd be well, it's been well received by the Not public. Not the Eric way. <laughs> <laughs> So we also have a school choice hearing. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm obviously I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be cautious, but have a strong recommendation. Um, um, school choice hearing, FY7, FY18, uh, budget, second, second quarter budget update, um, which I think theoretically is related to the FY19 budget hearing, but I'd like to, my preference uh, would be that the budget hearing happens first because for people who come, it's predictable when it happens. And yeah, I don't want to. I mean, I okay. those those should not be unduly linked. Actually, I don't think. Right. Um, my understanding is there's at least one, if not multiple, policy first reads 
that will be coming on the 13th. Is that accurate? Maybe not the 13th. Okay. I will remove. Well, these, these don't have to be through the 13th. I yeah. mean, just the what the committee wanted to know is what are the what are the what are the topics on our list? Right. So, so some of these are the 13th. Some of them might be beyond. Right. School committee. The other ones I have are um, superintendent goals discussion and vote, because it was part of it's about voting goals. Part of it's about a broader discussion about evaluation. Protocols. Uh, school committee protocols, warrant process. Yeah. And regional transportation and circuit breaker advocacy. Yeah, and I think you could even put um, regional advocacy as another topic yeah. beyond the letters. Mm. I mean, not necessarily for next meeting again, but just for the future. Right. I just have a, a timeline question. Mm -hmm. um, our vote for the regional budget that will go to town meetings, when is that scheduled for? Um, it is March. I'll tell you in one second. I'm sorry. I believe it's March. My kids seventh. Use, it is seventh. Yes, you're that's right. what I was going to say. Can we just double check? Right. Is that in time for the Leverett? Because I is it twenty five calendar days, twenty five business days? Because I we were just backing that up for our school committee, and we thought March fifth was kind of our deadline to get ours voted on. So I was just hmm. curious. We could have miscounted, so just I just want to make sure we hit the time frame. It's funny we've been debating right. Pelham, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, we have. We'll we'll look into it. I, mean, I, just, I don't want to no, miss no, no, it no, by a no, day. No, no, but Audrey, it's good you're bringing it up. I mean, right. we'll, we'll, this is something. Rather, I think rather than sitting here and trying to answer yeah. that question right now, right. it's like after you know we should. It, not to sound neurotic, but it might be nice if we just double checked all of them. Right. <laughs> just, to, just to double right. check, so we you know. Yeah, I'm clean on Amherst and Pelham, um, and I think I'm clean on Shutesbury. Um, who would be the person in Leverett? And I don't mind I think emailing. It's, I think it's Matt. Uh, Margie would be the one who puts okay. the line together. So I will follow Just to, up on Yeah, that. I, yeah. I want to say our town meeting's April 28th or 26th, whichever is that Saturday. Okay. And then we counted out 25 days on the calendar, but we weren't positive on the, I think, 28th. So, so I will check on that and then through Eric let the committee know. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I just listed a few other things that it looks sure. like we're going to talk about. Um, you can tell me if it's not coming up. So you mentioned an update on Summit Academy. Yeah, is that going to be I was planning on doing that just as an the budget. The it's a budget presentation and hearing, so okay. I, I thought that would be part of that. Yep. And the Smith vote vote also mm -hmm. as part of the budget. Okay. But that's that Smith vote is a separate vote. Yeah, yeah. it should be listed separately. Yeah. Um, You're right. Thank you. I, uh, do we need to bring a list of ideas for new member orientation to the next meeting, given the timeline? I think it'd be advisable if we had some kind of presentation, okay. initial presentation then. Why don't we we're going to keep on track. And we'll see where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. And then um, do you want me to bring whatever update from Mr. Terry on the super evaluation? Yes. Yeah, I was trying to phrase it, superintendent goals slash evaluation discussion and vote. I don't know if that's too broad. No, keep them together. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, superintendent goals and evaluation process. Mm -hmm. and that way it's very clear. Sure. That's yeah. where it's very clear, yeah. both of those things. Uh, that is That sounds like enough stuff right now to have on our agenda. Is there anything? If there's anything else, by the way, between meetings, you can always email me and Dr. Morris, and we'll put it in the queue. And next time, if we can, what we should do is try to have this same running, running list. And I know, Mike, we had done this before, where there were, at one point, I remember we had like three or four meetings, in which we had stuff mm -hmm. blocked out for different meetings. If we could, we, I mean, I'm happy to work with you on this, but I think we should do that mm -hmm. here. And, and it would be fluid enough that if members of the committee think something or just has good advice, like either you want it done sooner or, you know, Ms. Kosinski says you have to do it sooner because <laughs> we won't be able to get a budget done otherwise, then either way we'll, you know, we can hear that and move things around. I think that'd be nice. But we can, what we ought to do is set up a meet and yeah. we should, you and I should set up a meeting sometime between now and yeah. then and we'll, we'll do that. 
You actually are, I mean, the running list that I had for the meeting of the year, the good news for the committee, and the meeting that's going to end earlier than it said is, knock on wood, like a lot of those things that, remember we had this long laundry list? Yeah. Like that list is much, much shorter than it was six months ago, five months ago. So It'll keep getting shorter. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's good uh, news. So unless anyone wants to wait till 10 o'clock to adjourn, um, mm -hmm. Like it says on our on our agenda, I would entertain a motion. I move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> so that's a reluctant. Uh, all those in favor, of adjourning, raise your hand. It is unanimous. We adjourn. And thank you, Amherst Media.